test. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me? Excellent. I just wanted to start just by giving the opening remarks and, and basically giving, making sure our lightning talks folks get the maximum amount of time. Um, my morning is Ali, right? My name is Ali Foster. It's funny how stage fright still happens on screen. Um, good times. So anyway, um, I just wanna start the morning by welcoming everybody to day two of Access 2020 on the World Wide Web. Um, this morning, we're going to be starting with a series of lightning talks and uh, just some brief housekeeping details, as always, make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, just a reminder uh, that Access uh, conducts itself using a code of conduct. Uh, we believe in having harassment-free space. And if you have any questions about the policies or if you feel that there needs to be a follow-up to any sort of breach of that code of conduct, please contact AccessLibCon at gmail.com. Um, in addition, what's going to be happening this morning is basically the questions are going to be welcome. The lightning talks are going to be 10 minutes long, um, and there will be some time for questions. Um, I'm going to be joined by lovely timekeeper. Uh, our team timekeeper today is going to be, let's see, sorry, is Clara. Good morning, Clara. Thank you. Um, and uh, what we'll be doing is uh, answer, they'll be using the, the Q&A feature in Zoom to answer questions. Any questions we do not have time to answer, we'll be moving over to the community notes section so that they will still have an opportunity uh, to get some insight in, on your questions. Any, if you have, oh, thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, put the code of conduct link into the chat. If you have any questions about that, thank you very much. Thanks, Helena, that's kind. Digital kindness is excellent. There we go, right? Um, fantastic. So. It's 9.49 now. Um, are there any, if there's any questions, just pop them in the chat. Again, we'll be using Q&A. Um, if there's any questions about the Q&A feature, let me know. Um, but what I would like to do is, in, is if there are no questions, I'm gonna do the teacher pause. Excellent. So without further ado, I would like to, um, Ali, just, uh, oh, yeah. just one very quick comment. I think James has a couple of remarks that he's going to jump in oh, with. Oh, sorry, James. Hey, hey, sorry <clears throat> to no, interrupt. No, sorry. Uh, just a few remarks of general conference import. Uh, and uh, oh, my phone, Siri, okay. has decided to activate here. Thank you, Siri, for your help. Um, just wanted to welcome everyone on behalf of the organizing committee and also just acknowledge that our conference was originally planned to be hosted here in Vancouver on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Uh, and most of our organizers live and work there. Uh, and I'm here there on the downtown campus of Vancouver Community College. Um, and just to acknowledge that we all have an inherited responsibility to respect and nurture our relationship to the land and its first peoples past and present and address colonial harms. Um, and I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank OCLC, our longtime sponsor of the Dave Binkley uh, Memorial Lecture on Friday, the University of British Columbia, Simon Fraser University, and the BC Libra Libraries Cooperative. Uh, and I'd also like to thank the members of the Access 2019 Organizing Committee for their awesome support in helping us out and getting things off the ground, even at the stage when we were planning an in-person conference. Uh, that was especially helpful. Um, 
And then a few just housekeeping reminders. Um, we are asking you to please continue to submit your ideas for the Hackfest projects uh, through our website. Uh, we have a sign up for social events and, uh, sorry, someone's editing notes as I'm talking, uh, sign up for social events and uh, mentorship, especially we're looking for signups for that. Um, another note of uh, import Eventbrite is full of lies. So uh, the, apparently some of the emails going out from Eventbrite are wrong. So look for the handcrafted emails um, or just contact us and we can get you sorted. Um, we also are having reporting um, Peter Binkley, who is giving a talk at 1010, uh, his power is out. <laughs> Uh, and they are not saying they're gonna restore it until possibly one o'clock Pacific. So if anyone is speaking on Thursday or Friday and is able to swap, uh, or if you've pre-recorded and you're able just to answer questions in Peter's slot at 1010, uh, get in touch with us organizers, that would be great. Um, and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Ali. Great, sorry about that, James. I feel like my anxiety turned into overconfidence and I was like, I got this. So thank you very much. Um, so what I would like to do is just uh, introduce our lightning talks uh, for the morning. Um, first up is uh, James Sterno, who will be presenting a multiplayer voxel game world as a virtual conference space. Uh, John Derno is the head of library systems at the University of Victoria, where for the past 14 years, he's led the team responsible for developing and maintaining the library's IT infrastructure. His research activities include the recovery and restoration of Canadian Teledon artworks from the 1980s and curating a collection of historic computers. I'd like to turn it over to John. Uh, great, thanks, Ali. Um, so do I just sort of share my screen at this point? Doing? Yes, indeed, go for it. Okay, there we go. I'll uh, share my presentation here. Uh, okay, sorry. This is working a little bit differently than uh, it does when I just sort of press F5 and it works. There we go. Is everyone seeing the presentation now? I'm going to assume that's a yes. Um, <laughs> thanks, David. Nodding. Okay, good. Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name is John Durno. As, as Ali mentioned, um, I'm presenting on a multiplayer voxel game world as virtual conference space. Uh, despite the highfalutin title, this is actually just a shameless plug for a um, 3D game world that I have set up for the Access Conference uh, using a program called MindTest. And the generation of this idea came from the call for uh, uh, for innovative approaches uh, for, uh, you know, beyond a talk or web, a webinar style presentation um, and including those that inspire interaction and active engagement. So I was kind of thinking, okay, well, what can I do that isn't Zoom uh, and isn't, uh, you know, is this give people a little bit of a different online experience than, than Zoom? And it dredged up an old idea I had back when my son was a big Minecraft uh, player. Um, and this is the notion that I could actually set up, perhaps set up a Minecraft game world for the conference. This was like back in 2012 or thereabouts. My son has since uh, moved on from, from uh, Minecraft. Um, that never really happened for, for a number of reasons, but uh, I started to think looking into a little bit more and I found a thing called Mind test, which is kind of Minecraft like, uh, but it has a, a few unique advantages, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, and the uh, that idea grew into sort of two parallel ideas, one of which was mind test as a conference space, just some place where people could hang out and, and do stuff, you know, just sort of a, a relaxation space where, you know, if you like to build things or um, a little bit like the, the Lego table at Access 2009, um, where uh, people could just kind of hang out at the coffee breaks and make stuff out of Lego. And I think it was actually, it was, it was actually on, on YouTube, streamed on YouTube, if I'm remembering rightly. Uh, and then the other one was sort of mind test as makerspace. And this became the workshop that I'm going to be doing tomorrow. Basically looking at, okay, well, what can we do in a 3D game world like space that's sort of makerish that might sort of sub in for some of the maker makerspace stuff that we normally like to do, but we can't do right now because all of those spaces are closed. Uh, so looking at uh, um, some of the more kind of advanced features of the of the of the world uh, and of the of the of the game space, let's say so. Um, uh, why mind test instead of Minecraft? Um, well, uh, big one, no cost. Uh, no cost either to me uh, or to the participants, right? If you want to 
people want to play Minecraft on a server, you have to have a Minecraft ID, which means you have to pay Microsoft uh, $30 or so. Uh, not, uh, you know, some people already have them, of course, particularly people with children, but um, the, uh, uh, you can't really expect most conference attendees to, to want to cough up uh, 30 bucks for something like that. Uh, it's got good cross-platform support, so Mac, Linux, even Windows apparently is supported. Um, uh, mods are installed server-side. If anyone's ever tried to set up a Minecraft server and wanted to run a modded Minecraft server, um, you would appreciate the, the fact that that's actually good because um, I'll, I'll get into that at the workshop tomorrow if anybody's interested. Um, Good hackerspace like build options. So the stuff we're going to be looking at at the workshop tomorrow, in which anybody is welcome to come in and join and use, a uh, thing called Mesicons, which is like basically like sort of electrical circuitry breadboarding stuff. Uh, digital digital lines, which is like RS two thirty two serial connections in game, and then programmable in great game robots as well. So we'll be looking at all of those uh, tomorrow. Um, and as I say, this leverages years of parental experience. So I was able to get up to speed fairly quickly on, on what the uh, server, or how, how to manage a mind test server, uh, just because I'd done similar things for, for my son back when, uh, back when Minecraft was, was cool. Uh, and uh, not too hard for anybody to learn. I mean, it's ultimately sort of a children's game, right? So most people can learn at least the basics of it in just a, in just a few minutes. Um, so what can I do in mind test when I'm there? Um, well, number of things, won't belabor any of them because time is short. You can ride the train. There is an in-game train that goes to a uh, in-game geodesic dome. Uh, this is kind of an allusion to Expo. I was sort of thinking I was building kind of an Expo 67 slash 86 type space. So you've got to have a train slash monorail and a, a geodesic dome. You can check out the computer lab. The computers work. You can play the worst game of, my, of uh, Tetris that you have ever played in your life on one of these computers. You can also send email in game if you don't get enough email in your real life. Um, let's see. Uh, you can visit the Minotaur in the Labyrinth, one of the programmable in game robots. Uh, build cool things. It's a building game, so you can build stuff um, and work with logic gates, programmable robots. And more importantly, help to build Exploding Thing. Uh, exploding Thing is a, um, an idea that I had where we would all collaboratively build things on a, on a place in the game called Exploding Thing Island. And um, then at the end of the game, we will blow it up. Um, <laughs> at the end of the conference, I should say, we will blow, we will blow up this thing that we've all collaboratively built. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll see if anything, uh, anything happens there. But uh, yeah, so that's pretty much uh, all I had to say. Um, there's some uh, information that will be coming to you in your email if it hasn't already showed up, uh, giving you the mind test server address and password. Uh, if you have any questions, please contact me. Uh, and please do check out the website, which will also be in the email. if It's not there already. So uh, that is all, and I will stop talking now. Great, thanks very much, John. That was great. That was excellent. Um, are there any questions? Seen some great comments. People are very stoked about Burning Man. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Sorry, any uh, any questions here? A oh, question from Eva's um, specs for hardware server. Ah, uh, well, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, right now I'm running it on one of our brand new staff desktops. Um, it's not actually a server class machine, but it's a pretty good desktop uh, on, uh, let's see, it's a Dell Optiplex 5060 with about 16 gigs of RAM, um, a bunch of cores. Um, it's I have no idea how many users this thing can support. So one of the, this whole thing's kind of an experiment, right? I haven't had a chance to stress test the server at all. So one of the things I'm gonna be interested in is whether it keels over and dies if a certain number of people connect to it at the same time. Um, but, uh, but I've got it on some fairly beefy hardware, so I think we should probably be okay. Great. And now Claire is saying we have about two minutes for questions. And uh, just a quick note from our, our conference organizer folks to just please use Q&A feature. So we have, I'll quickly say one um, from Joanne Patterson, where she said, how easy, like, so basically I think it's about like the learning curve of using, of using the software. Um, learning curve of using the software, um, as, I, as I say, just if you're wanting to play the game on a sort of fairly basic level where you kind of 
set up the software, you connect to the server and you just build things in the world. Uh, it's something you could probably learn in about 15 to 20 minutes. I've got a, a tutorial on, on my website that just gives you the, the absolute, absolute basics of it. Um, if you wanted to learn some of the more advanced features, um, it, that can take you know several hours. Uh, uh, you can actually write up to a few days if you really wanted to dig into it. Some of the more advanced features are not that well documented, which is part of the problem. So you kind of have to play around with stuff just to sort of get a sense of how it works. Um, but uh, one of the disadvantages of mind test is that the uh, the online community is not that large. Uh, so. Um, uh, uh, so you don't get the same kind of range of YouTube videos and, and helpful wikis and things like that that you do with Minecraft. But there is some good stuff out there. Okay. Great. Thank you. And there's just one, I think, so we have about 30 seconds left, but basically it seems like a yes or no. I read online this can be run on Raspberry Pi. It can. Yes, it can. Um, it doesn't support too many users uh, on a Raspberry Pi, I don't think. But uh, if you just wanted to run it for yourself or a couple of close friends, then yeah, it uh, would totally work, I think. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, John. That was excellent. Uh, next up, uh, we're going to be hearing from David Kemper. Um, he's going to be presenting uh, web usability testing under quarantine using video conferencing to conduct remote usability testing. Uh, so David is a digital experience librarian at McMaster University Library, where he chairs the library's web committee, manages the digital experience department, and is responsible for designing and developing public web interfaces that deliver satisfying user experiences. In his spare time, he enjoys hiking and photography. He usually combines his two passions every weekend among Hamilton, Ontario's many conservation areas. And as an Ontario expat, I am very jealous, but I'm happy for you, David. Excellent. So uh, if you want to share, <laughs> oh, David, perfect, you're sharing. So I'm going to stop my video. Um, and if you'd like to share your screen, you can go right ahead. Sure. All right. Thanks very much, Ali. Let me get my share screen up here. And I'm going to present mode. So I hope everyone can see. It seems to be loading up properly. Okay. Well, I can't see the Zoom screen, huh? The, the joys of having two monitors. All right. Anyway, I'm assuming everyone can see. So, and I hope everyone can hear me as well. Yes, um, you're all so set. Okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> okay, awesome. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is David Kemper, and I'm a digital experience librarian at McMaster University. And today I want to talk about uh, web usability testing under quarantine. So using video conferencing software to conduct remote web usability uh, tests. So uh, since my time is short, uh, this is the main takeaway I hope you can all get from this presentation. So essentially during the pandemic lockdown, when uh, campuses closed and students, faculty and staff were physically apart, uh, the use of software such as uh, Zoom and MS Teams uh, has proved to be a surprisingly effective approach to conducting web usability testing with the benefit of recording and rewatching the testing sessions at a later date. So typically um, our library web committee, we would often do uh, web usability testing in person. So under normal circumstances, a member of the library web committee um, and a student or other members of our um, university community, community would sit in a room, a classroom or a conference room and conduct the web usability tests in person, face to face. Uh, and that was quite effective. And you can gain some great feedback and, uh, and identify some usability issues with your website. However, as we all know, in March, COVID-19 rampaged across the world and essentially it forced our university and many other universities to close abruptly and indefinitely, sending students, faculty and staff home to enforce social distancing rules and to work and study remotely. So as chair of the library committee and as all my committee members wondered, how could the library web committee proceed with its plans to still to conduct web usability testing when everyone was physically apart? So some of us, including myself, resigned ourselves to the possibility of no more usability testing until campus reopened. And as we can see, that's probably gonna be a very long time. But further brainstorming, we discovered an alternate, alternative option. So the testing must go on, go on no matter what. So in 2019, the university purchased a site-wide license to Office 365, which included a, a, an application called Microsoft Teams, which is essentially a collaboration and video conferencing software. 
So this purchase was quite um, a wise decision because when the pandemic came and the campus shut down, all university staff were now using Teams to collaborate and work remotely. So after some discussion, the library web committee chose Teams to conduct web usability testing. So I wanna dive into some of the planning that we did. So myself and another librarian, uh, Inez Perkovic, who's a business information librarian at Big Master, we both prepared 10 web usability task-based questions, which is pretty much standard practice. And then we contacted through Teams, 11 library student assistants, um, all of whom worked in the library and they too were sent home because of the pandemic and were willing to participate in our testing. So we booked 30 minute individual testing sessions. We scheduled overall 45 minutes in case we needed more time to be with the students or if we needed an extra 15 minutes just to write down some notes. So we explained to the students uh, how the process would go and I, I highly recommend uh, referring to the book by Steve Krug. He's written numerous books and he's really knowledgeable in that area. Uh, we asked the student assistants for permission to record the testing session, which we got. We asked the students then to share their desktop screen and then browse the library website homepage. And from that point on, we then conducted the web uh, website usability test, asking those 10 web usability questions. So the outcomes. So I won't dive into, because of lack of time, won't dive into all the things that we discovered, but one thing that really came up besides collecting useful information and actionable user feedback, is that we discovered using video conferencing software was an effective approach to conducting web usability tests. So um, some of the strengths that we did, uh, identified was that Microsoft Teams, since that was the only product that we used, was able to mimic the in-person testing experience pretty closely we could focus on asking questions and follow-up questions knowing that a recording was being made which we could review later and i thought that was really good because we could go back to the video edit our notes clarify our notes um, during the the present during the testing we could see the movement of their mouse pointers and listen to them narrate their thinking process and then the recording which was made could be shown to the library web committee so other members of the committee as well as the library leadership team at a later time, sort of as a way of evidence or to prove a certain decision we can make with usability uh, or changes to the to the website. That being said, there's some a little bit of a few weaknesses that we identified with it is that no matter what, we're definitely not in person. We're still talking to someone through a screen. And it should be noted that not all students were technically savvy. Some hand holding was needed to, for example, share the screen. And not all students had reliable internet uh, connection. So that resulted in us having to have them repeat themselves because the poor internet connection and the connection had sort of gone in and out at times. So the lessons that we learned is that uh, if anything, the pandemic taught us, or for that matter, forced us to change our usual usability testing approach swiftly. So in a way, the pandemic and the campus uh, closures had to force us to rethink our legacy processes. How do we do things? And nowadays we can see we have curbside delivery, we have bookable study spaces, all being done only through the website. And lastly, one thing that we've learned is with proper preparation, access to a pool of volunteers and a shared video conferencing software platform, such as Teams or Zoom, which our university both have, um, a library web committee, a web team, or even a solo librarian can conduct usability tests and collect useful feedback in the midst of a pandemic and a campus shutdown, or for that matter, any non-pandemic scenarios. So once again, the key takeaway, and that's it on my part. Thank you very much. Fantastic, thank you, David. It's very interesting. Um, so we have several questions here for some folks. Um, oh, for, ooh, lots of questions. I have them too, because I just moved into usability. So like, I have some skin in the game on this one. Um, <laughs> so so uh, first question we have is, if you can only pick one, which Steve Krug book do you recommend for newbies to usability testing? I think the, I believe his first one, Don't Make Me Think, is probably like the best book to start off with. The other, the other one was, um, I think something to do with Rocket Science. Um, that's a second book. But I really think it's a Steve Krug's first book, Don't Make Me Think, is really, it's, it's pretty much, I think at this point, quite timeless in its, in its, uh, in its advice and usefulness. Great. 
Excellent. And Claire is saying we have three minutes for questions. So I'll keep that in mind as we go through. Um, next question was, how do we, how can we build access to a pool of volunteers if we didn't have one pre-pandemic? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, we, we had library student assistants who at that point, you know, on, on the one hand, they were somewhat biased because they kind of know our library, but at the same time, at that time of the, during the pandemic, we, um, they, they, the, time was short for them to work. So in order to extend their time to work with us, we decided to hire them on as, as basically individuals to help us with, with, with the testing. So we kind of had a pool of students that were readily available because uh, when the campus closed, they had nothing else to do. So uh, I would say, you know, what we're trying to do right now is tr at, the, at the moment, you know, virtually or whenever we get back to campuses, build um, what we're calling like, you know, user group or user feedback channels, you know, identify groups on campus and, and build relationships with them so that when it comes time for you to start testing your, your website or anything for that matter, a new, new service, a new application, like you have a group. So we're, we're currently working with a disability experts group to test the accessibility of our website. We're also working with um, the uh, IT student advisory committee group, which represents central IT uh, students, um, you know, basically advising campus on their technology needs. So we're trying to make inroads with different areas. So I think if you don't have a pool right now, don't worry, but just reach out and identify groups of people that you can eventually build relationships. And then eventually you can start tapping into them when you need that help for doing usability testing. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so we have one minute left for questions. So I will ask this next one and then the rest will go to the community notes. So get everybody. Um, so the last question I have is from Scott Young. Uh, which other programs did you, David, and the committee consider before moving forward with Teams? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, at that time, and we're, we did these tests near the end of April. So we're talking about almost a month in after the, the, the sudden closures of campus. So we, the university had access to, I think at that point, two major or three major platforms. So we had Teams, we had Zoom, and we had uh, WebEx. Um, the one, the, we, we worked with Teams, we chose Teams. It was the most widely available um, Basically, like students also had access to Teams, so we could easily bring them into it as well. Um, so it was it really boiled down to we didn't have much time. I mean, to to to, to think. So we really just said, okay, we're using to, uh, to Teams to conduct our uh, meetings, so maybe we'll use that to do our testing. So it was really a bit of a um, you know who knows maybe Zoom is maybe has some more better features, but at that time we really just looked at things. Time was short, we were familiar with the tool. Let's try it, let's go with it. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dave, that was excellent. And um, so uh, now I'd like to take the time, so thank you, as well as uh, uh, yeah, we're you. going to uh, have our next talk would be from uh, the Modernizing the Digital Preservation Platform uh, by William Wubbleman. Um, so William's main roles at CRKN are managing the development and operation of the Canadiana Preservation Platform and coordinating its trustworthy digital repository activities. To stay occupied during the pandemic, he has been recording song covers every week and posting them to YouTube, whether they're good or not, and I respect that commitment. Um, so I would like to uh, take this time to hand it over to William, and you can please start sharing your screen. And Okay, can is am I good to go? Can everyone hear you me? See my screen? It looks fantastic. You're good to go. All right. Okay. Um, so uh, just before I begin, I'd, I'd like to quickly um, acknowledge that the land that uh, CRKN staff gather to work at and work on in Ottawa is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. Um, and today what I'm going to just do is talk a little bit about uh, the Canadiana platform and which is the infrastructure that manages CRKN's trustworthy digital repository and provides uh, access to digitized content through Canadiana.ca, Heritage and several partner collections. 
since the 2018 merger of Canadiana.org with CRKN, we've been working on the third major revision of the platform. And I'm just going to provide a, a review of the development to date and where we're going in the future. All right, Will, as soon as I can give PowerPoint focus. Um, all right. Come on. There we go. Okay. So the original Canadiana platform um, was developed as an experiment to replace microfiche as the method for delivering uh, documentary heritage content to university libraries. Uh, it launched back in 1998, which, um, if you're counting, makes it about the same age as Google, uh, and was one of the first online digitized collections. It had you know, many limitations and it didn't really scale well, but it, it did work. It was effective and um, microfiche distribution was phased out in the early 2000s. In 2010, we released a complete rewrite of the platform. Um, now, by this time, there was some off the shelf and community to develop alternatives that were starting to, to appear and that existed, but at that time, they would have all required extensive customization to meet our needs. So we still went with an in-house solution. Uh, key improvements included you know, better performance, um, automated data replication and fixity checking, uh, support for multiple collections and portals, and native support for serials. Since then, uh, the collections have grown by about two orders of magnitude, and a majority of the content in our repository is now archival rather than bibliographic in nature. Um, we have redundant nodes distributed across the country, which have in, has increased resiliency, and the removal at the beginning of 2019, the removal of the need to maintain a paywall uh, has really simplified our technical requirements and makes using third-party components a lot more straightforward. So we are in the middle of uh, transforming the platform into its third major revision. And our major goal is to really make use of standard components uh, and formats linked together in a microservice architecture. And this will support an agile approach to delivering incremental improvements over time and will also allow us to focus our in-house efforts on our, our, sort of our unique needs at, rather than reinventing wheels and to increase the feasibility of interoperating with other digital repositories. So far, uh, what we've done is we've transformed our object store to use OpenStack Swift, which creates uh, essentially a, a private cloud environment where we can easily add storage um, and when it has needed and adopt more flexible policies regarding the number and location of copies of files. Uh, we're also using Docker and Puppet, which greatly simplifies the deployment management and replacement of servers and has allowed us to stop using uh, virtual machines. And we've modernized our hardware and we will be renewing it um, on a regular, our infrastructure on a regular basis to ensure that our systems are kept supported and the number of different configurations uh, is manageable. Uh, in the future, we'll be looking also to use Kubernetes to orchestrate containers and to allow for better performance and failover. On the application side, um, we're nearly completed, we've nearly completed separating our preservation and access functions into separate platforms. Uh, that will allow us to evolve them independently of one another and to create access objects that are independent of the underlying preservation structures. That in turn will allow us to simplify our preservation process and to update access related metadata such as OCR and MARC records without touching any of the preservation content. Uh, and once that's done, we plan to adopt Archivematica as our preservation package and an ingest platform. Uh, Archivematica already has many of the features that we would otherwise have to develop on our own, and it's now viable to, to use it. Uh, we're using Cantaloupe to serve images to end users, and we will be implementing full IIIF support, including CAMS and annotation functions. And those architectural features are going to allow us uh, products with a platform that will be much more easily extended to support new features and capabilities. And I have one second left, and now I don't. Okay, thanks very much, William. Um, are there any questions? Oh, there's some in our Q&A coming up, great. Uh, so Eugene saying kudos for thinking about full IIF support, uh, but will the Archivematica pipeline be automated, automated or semi-manual? 
Um, I don't know yet because we haven't uh, started to, um, to, to implement it yet. My expectation would be uh, semi-manual at first and more automated as time goes on. <laughs> Thanks. We have oh we actually we have four yeah perfect played on the schedule perfect. And Russell's uh, has posted a GitHub link. Will so this is the link. Digital preservation will be where this all gets discussed. So there is a link in the um, chat. If anyone has any um, more questions about that. Any other questions before we um, continue on? Great, well, thank you very much, William, and thank you to all our Lightning Talks presenters. That was excellent. Um, so that concludes the Lightning Talk portion of our morning, of our sessions. Uh, we're going to be now um, hearing from Matt Hukulek uh, from the University of Victoria, and I'm gonna give him a moment to get set up. Uh, we'll be presenting the long view in digital exhibit de there, design and preservation. Apologies. Just to make sure if Matt is looking in the Let's make sure you're here and ready. Oh yeah, you're here. Great. There we go. Can, every, can you hear me? Yeah, I can see and hear you. Excellent. There's actually four of us presenting. Is there oh, any way to bring them in too? Oh, I apologize. Okay, I just, I just had you. I had, my, I had just had you. Listen. That's all right. That's all right. Matt, can you give us the, the names and we'll promote everyone to panelists? Yeah. Sure. It's um, Samantha McFarlane, Braden Justice, and Tiffany Chan. Now we were planning on all presenting together, but I could do it on my own if that's not possible. Oh, there's Samantha. That's not an issue. We'll get them all as panels. Thank you. There's Brayden. And there's Tiffany. I'm very sorry about that, Matt, but now we have an Avengers Assemble moment. All right, there you so go. All right. And we can talk even yeah. faster now, too. Yeah. Okay, you know what, then, just to make sure, um, I apologize, but you know what? Welcome to all four presenters, co-presenters. I'm going to hand it over to you, and we can be in the long view and digital exhibit design and preservation. Thank you so much, folks. Great. Um, could we do a, just a quick mic check on, on the four? Matt, your mic is working great. How about Samantha? Could you unmute yourself and we'll check that? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Uh, Brayden? Hi. Hi, working great. Tiffany? Hey. Okay, all right, all set. Thank you so much. Great, and should I share, should I share my screen or Tiffany, did you wanna share yours? Uh, I can share it. As Tiffany gets that uh, up on the screen, I'll start our paper, which is called The Long View in Digital Exhibit Design and Preservation, a Spotlight at the University of Victoria Libraries. Um, when it comes to digital projects, we all know libraries are an indispensable part of long-term preservation work. But while faculty members, students, and community members often focus on the immediate scope of projects, the five years of a grant, for example, librarians and developers, keenly aware of risks and link rot and digital obsolescence, tend to take the long view. As a result, researchers and students at the University of Victoria are more frequently partnering with libraries to plan for long-term preservation of and access to their work. So in this talk, we want to discuss one way in particular that the libraries have worked with researchers to create sustainable digital projects. The open source exhibit platform Spotlight, which supports the library's commitment to open access and promotes public knowledge creation. We are separating our talk into three parts, faculty and community engagement, working with faculty to plan sustainable research projects and build Spotlight exhibits into grants for long-term preservation, technical adaptability, and finally, digital exhibit design. I'll be speaking for four minutes on faculty and community engagement. Um, 
and switch to the second slide here. And I just wanna pause for a moment to reflect on both the technical and social developments needed to address issues of faculty and student engagement when it comes to project support and long-term preservation. The Digital Scholarship Commons at the University of Victoria Libraries, as many other DS units across the country, offer different ways of thinking about collaboration and labor relations in the library. And I wanna state that I'm not a programmer, notwithstanding many years of trying, my professional duties have kept me in a perpetual place of being able to read code, but when it comes to speaking, I barely get past hello world. So what happens when librarians are embedded with programmers? Or in the case of my colleague, Sam, um, with other content experts whose job it is to provide narrative life to collections so assiduously described, preserved, and made available by librarians and archivists. In short, we become an interdisciplinary skunk work, so to speak, where traditional professional boundaries, and dare I say union boundaries, mix, share, collaborate, and create things that are of great use to our communities. Much of the work we do as a group is based on another non-traditional role, that of the grants and awards librarian. In 2012, Christine Wald was hired at the university libraries. She was hired as the university library's first, and perhaps even the first in the world, grants and awards librarian. Her role was to think about how the university library could further embed itself within faculty and student research throughout its life cycle. Her work led to the creation of the grants menu, a ready-made menu for researchers, wherever they may be in their career, including students, with certain guaranteed support by the library. This ranges from digitization to data management, from training to e-publishing, metadata consulting to subject librarian expertise. This provides librarians and archivists with a powerful tool for collaboration. It gives me an opportunity to work with researchers from day one in the development of their projects and to bring the full weight of librarian and archivist expertise onto projects. We've been very successful in this journey. Every researcher receives a letter of support from us. That letter outlines a research data management plan, a metadata plan, a long-term preservation plan. In most cases, it also includes faculty and student training plans, which happens in the library. You can imagine how useful this is to committees who must think about how public money is being spent and whether or not researchers have anticipated the long-term preservation and accessibility issues associated with their projects. We're currently involved with 11 grant projects right now. One such project is the Narrative Art and Visual Storytelling um, and Holocaust and Human Rights Education grant that started as a connections grant through SHRC. In its first iteration, I was brought to Germany in order to give workshops on building digital exhibits and preserving one's files. In the second application, the library's role grew to be the place where the important work developed will be collated and shared for the long term, and as a place for student training in which students learn about metadata and digital preservation. But none of this work can happen in a vacuum. I rely heavily on my colleagues to help develop metadata schemas and platforms on which to showcase our work. We've developed a twofold technical system at the university library, Vault, which is our long-term collections management system for storage and accessibility, and Spotlight, an, an exhi exhibition platform that allows content experts to interpret the work we've preserved. This is a beautiful collaboration that brings libraries and researchers into a shared union. And I just wanna talk about how this is great for the library in terms of upping our vision on campus um, as, Office of Research Services thinks about us and sends faculty and students our way. But in order for all of this to work, in order for the libraries to play such a central role in, re in the research life cycle, we've needed to bring together systems, librarians, archivists, and content experts to work together in non-traditional ways. Technical expertise matched with content expertise has revolutionized the way we can collaborate with our university community. And I'll pass the conversation over to Braden and Tiffany now who will describe the technical aspects of our work together. Hi everyone, I'm Braden. Um, I'm gonna talk about Vault, our preservation system. So Vault is UVic's uh, digital asset management system and is built on Samvera stack, which mostly consists or mainly consists of uh, the Fedora Commons repository, Solar, Redis, and Sidekick. The Fedora Commons repository is a preservation system that stores binary files like images, video, audio, that sort of thing, as well as met metadata. Um, it also has integrity checking, which uh, is there to make sure that there's no issues with corruption in your files. So if you get a bad drive or power failure, it can check and make sure that nothing's happened to your actual 
files and you don't need to restore anything from a backup. Um, the solar indexer um, is the part of the system that allows us for fast searching. So we can um, quickly bring up search results and then facet them um, and allow people to filter down to exactly what they're looking for. Um, Fedora also stores all of the metadata as RDF. So we can store fast and Library of Congress URIs in Fedora and then store the correct English sub, uh, subject headings in, in Solar, which is what shows up in our user interface. So that's really nice and allows us to sort of connect um, things through Semantic Web. Um, with the Redis, and, uh, Redis Key Value Store and Sidekick Job Queuing System uh, work in tandem as well. They uh, allow for big processing jobs to run in the background on the main web server or a different one. And uh, each job will only use the resources available to it without slowing down the system. So if there's too many jobs, they'll actually wait their turn as to not overexert uh, the system resources. Uh, finally, the glue that kind of holds it all together, connects everything up is Samvera, which is built with Ruby on Rails. Um, the actual website interface we have is also built with Ruby on Rails, so it just sort of clicks on top of Samvera, which is nice. Um, one of the features that we're quite proud of at UVic is, is the multi-tenancy part of our system, uh, which is integrated into the digital asset, uh, which is, a, uh, there's a program called uh, Apartment, which is integrated into our digital asset management system hence the term tenancy, uh, which allows us to use one main web server running one code base uh, and let us generate completely walled off empty duplicate sites for our faculty and researcher. Anyone who needs a separate site for a grant just for them with their own URL can simply request one and we can usually get that to them the next, by the next day. Um, and uh, this is done at no extra expense to the library. There's no need to request a new virtual machine or set up a new server or anything like that. It's all one server, one code base. Uh, another thing we're proud of is uh, a new feature we're working on. Uh, it allows us to connect Vault with our digital exhibition software, Spotlight. Uh, Vault tenancy managers can request a new Spotlight exhibit. Then um, they can map all their metadata from their fields in Vault to the custom fields they've set up in Spotlight. And um, once a Vault admin approves the, the data copied into Spotlight, the Vault system does everything else for uh, us automatically and puts everything into Spotlight for us, generates kind of a migration to copy the metadata into Spotlight um, along with required binaries. Although most of the binaries will not be copied into Spotlight and instead will be seamlessly linked to Vault in a way that makes it seem like they're, they have been migrated and duplicated in Spotlight, even though they haven't. Um, and I'll pass it over to Tiffany to talk more about that. Okay. Okay. Um, so in order to transfer the metadata from Vault to Spotlight, we actually use IIIF. Um, and so we rely on the IIIF manifest file, which is JSON that contains metadata for the object um, as well as a reference to where the image lives. So essentially the URI. And each item in Vault has a manifest associated with it. And to humans, a manifest just kind of looks like data barf, um, but a computer can actually parse it quite easily. And so the initial manifest we got with Vault was quite sparse. So we kind of had to fill it out um, with our own data. And then this metadata gets sucked from the manifest into Spotlight. Um, where the labels and values are mapped and then translated into another manifest in Spotlight to display the image basically with our viewer, which is the mirror door viewer that you can see um, on the slide. So this transfer process has a couple key advantages, some of which Brayden mentioned before. Um, so one is that it allows for batch processing and because the machine can parse through all the data um, itself and usually pull the useful stuff out. Um, and as Braden mentioned before, we don't have to duplicate images. We just simply point to the URI of the image in Vault as opposed to Spotlight. Um, and then sort of vanilla Spotlight didn't use Mirador, so we kind of integrated um, that viewer into it. And then I'll just give a brief overview of some features that weren't originally in Spotlight um, when we got it sort of out of the box. Um, so Vanilla Spotlight was originally designed to store and display images only, 
Um, whereas we at UVic have sort of modified it so it can store and display video, um, audio, PDFs, and 3D models using the Sketchfab API. And so here's an example of a widget um, that just pulls the coordinate data from each item and then plots them all onto this map using the Google Maps API. Um, and it lets people browse the exhibit by location. And this is an example of a 3D model um, that we've uploaded to Sketchfab and then embedded in our exhibit website. Um, we also had to add support for compound objects. So that is objects that can be subdivided into constituent parts, such as a postcard with two sides or a book with hundreds of pages. Um, and so Vanilla Spotlight kind of only had one image per object. And so this was sort of our way of getting to attach two or more images to one object, such as pages from this sketchbook here. Um, and that was also kind of one of the reasons we chose to integrate Mirador because it lets you represent that and browse through um, with thumbnails or just like next and back. And so we do have a public repository with all the code um, for our specific instance of Spotlight. Um, and as a developer, I would say that because Spotlight is open source, it gives us a lot of flexibility to tailor the software to the specific like needs and strengths of each exhibit. And that's a major benefit of it, actually. Um, and now I'll pass things over to Sam, who will do a deep dive into two of our exhibits. Okay, thanks, Tiffany. Um, can you all hear me okay? So for the final part of our talk, um, I want to take a very quick look at two spotlight exhibits that illustrate what we've been talking about so far. So the first one we want to show you because we think it illustrates well the integrated workflow of Vault and Spotlight that Matt Braden and Tiffany have all referred to. Um, so if we go to the next slide here, the, the first thing we're looking at is a digital collection in Vault called Banda Through Time which is a collection created by Uvic anthropology professor Ann Stahl that features cultural heritage materials from the Banda traditional area in Ghana. So all the archival materials provided by Dr. Stahl and other researchers on her team are stored here. And in fact, they reside on a separate tenancy, so a site with its own URL um, as part of the multi-tenancy system that Braden mentioned. Uh, but as you can see, since Vault's primary purpose is as a repository for long-term preservation, you can see all of the metadata for the items there. Um, so this is, this is public facing, it's openly accessible, anyone can see it, but there's no framing narrative that explains these items in relation to each other or that places them in a broader context. So you know, that might be a cultural context or a critical context that's not really there in Vault. That's really the function of Spotlight, which we see primarily as a storytelling platform. Um, so once the digital collection banded through time was created in Vault, um, which again is to ensure the sustainability of the primary research materials, the items were imported to a spotlight exhibit. And it's there that Dr. Stahl and her team were able to arrange those items for exhibition. It's here in the exhibit, which as you can see is called Improving African Futures Using Lessons from the Past, that you can learn more about the story behind those materials. So there are different portals through which users can learn about the background of the project, as well as the region's location and landscapes, its history and heritage. So you have all of the digitized items from Vault now deliberately arranged and accompanied by an explanatory framework written by content experts. So that gives it a more coherent meaning um, to those items. So the second exhibit is called Volatile Attractions, Saul Holif, Johnny Cash, and Managing a Music Legend, which is an exhibit dedicated to the archives of Saul Holif, who was Johnny Cash's manager between the years 1961 and 1973. So what I wanna highlight here is how our developers create unique functionalities uh, that are not default components of Spotlight, but that really enable us to tell the stories that we wanna tell. Uh, Tiffany has noted some of these features already, but the Holof exhibit usefully illustrates a couple of examples of this as well. Uh, first of all, creating structured narratives in which we use the collection items to tell a story is really fundamental to our vision for the platform's usage. Uh, in the Hall of Exhibit, the narrative arc we chose was biographical. So if you click on the icon for the main exhibit on the homepage, there are then 10 sections that users can follow through in chronological order to learn about Hall of's childhood, his career with Johnny Cash, and so on. But while the basic version of Spotlight will always allow you to navigate from the sidebar, and you can see that on the left there, the capacity to go from one page to the next to follow along in this linear fashion by clicking at the bottom there was something that our developers actually built in. And this intuitive and seamless way of navigating the interface is to my mind a basic but crucial feature that enables us to create immersive and compelling narratives. 
The second feature I want to highlight is the option to add, add compound objects, which Tiffany already talked a little bit about, um, and which I think is best exemplified by a scrapbook that we included in the Holof exhibit. So the scrapbook, which you can see on the screen there, is 213 pages full of items that Holof chose and arranged himself. And because it presents a visual narrative of his life as he saw it, we thought that it was important not to selectively extract material from the scrapbook. So to just scan a few pages or items, but to keep everything situated in its context. So the scrapbook was fully digitized and users can scroll through a complete digital surrogate of it in the exhibit. Uh, but we were able to include this as a centerpiece of the exhibit only because our developers created that functionality, which did not previously exist on the platform. And so to me, this example epitomizes the collaborative approach that we've been talking about and advocating for here. And in fact, the Hall of Exhibit won the 2019 ACRL Leave Exhibition Award for Best Electronic Exhibit. And the committee commented on the very thing that we could not have done without this collaboration between content experts, librarians, archivists, developers, our metadata unit, and our digitization center. They remarked on the exhibit's use of multimedia, its multiple modes of navigation, and our complete digitization of the exhibit items, which the committee noted provides research value beyond the life of the ex exhibition. This is, I think, another way of saying that we took the long view by working to preserve and make accessible materials for the use of researchers and community members for years to come. And this is what we hope to continue to do by building partnerships and leveraging different kinds of expertise within and beyond the libraries. And I'm mindful of time, so we'll conclude there. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Sam. And I'd like to give a big thank you to Matt, uh, Samantha, uh, Braden, and Tiffany uh, for your excellent presentation. Um, so I would like to uh, just open it now to questions uh, for this team. Patricia says, very cool. I agree. Excellent. So Krista has a question. Um, have you had to say no to any projects? And um, there's two questions, which I appreciate. No problem, Krista. Also, hi, Krista. I remember you from school. Um, have you, so if you had to say no to any projects, and then do you have any templates for identifying needs for access or preservation to decide and to decide what your capacity is? I'll take that one on as a digital scholarship librarian. Um, that's a great question. And we're being recorded, so I, I don't know how to say this properly, but we were actually kind of shocked at how successful the grants menu became. Um, so we're always sort of in this, this attention between wanting to support faculty and students in their work, um, but you don't know if the grant is actually gonna come through or not, right? So a lot of this is, is you're anticipating the future and you're not sure, um, and, all of the grants have been successful. So I think that caught us a little bit off guard. Um, and we've had to, working through the past two years with all of these grants, we've, one of the reasons why I think it's so wonderful to have this collaboration is we can sort of put work um, in different places. Um, but when it comes to student training, I tend to take that on. When it comes to exhibits, Sam has been there to fulfill that. And then Braden and Tiffany have been incredible with developing those services that a specific faculty member might need. So to answer your question directly, we have absolutely recognized the need to put together a grants committee where we can gather regularly to start making these decisions. Um, but I think naturally as librarians and archivists, we never want to say no. But I think as we reach that capacity, which I think we, we are finally reaching that boundary, um, we're gonna have to make those tough decisions. So we don't have a template yet, um, but we are very, I think one of the ways we've dealt with this question is when it comes to Volt, we're very strict in terms of metadata. Um, and we, we give people a lot more freedom when it comes to Spotlight, but in order to help that workflow and save time, we require them to use very specific metadata fields that does help us sort of maintain a, a sense of, of, of control and, and time management. So thank you for that question. Great, thank you, Matt. Now, um, so it looks like we are actually are currently out of time for questions. Um, however, all of the unanswered questions currently are going to be transferred over to community notes. Um, so we'll have a chance to answer them there. So thank you very much. Um, now I would like, as we're moving through, I know that uh, this morning James mentioned that uh, that Peter was wait no sorry never mind we're not on that yet I'm skipping ahead 
Um, so what I would like to do is now give time for Erin Wolf uh, to share her screen um, and can give her presentation. Uh, she'll be presenting today, Documenting a Crisis, Capturing a Web Archive of a Local Community's Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic. Erin Wolf is the Metadata Librarian for the University of Kansas. And I apologize, Erin, I already had a gender issue. Like he, Erin, he, I apologize. Uh, research areas of interest include computational analysis of text-based content. And when not working, he enjoys hiking and spending time in nature, preferably involving the woods or the ocean. I'd like to hand that over to, I'd like to hand it over to Erin now. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, am I am I sharing? Yeah, I can see your screen. That's perfect. Okay, excellent. All right, well, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I would like to thank the conference organizers for all their hard work on this. It's been really great so far, and I'm definitely looking forward to the rest of the week. Uh, this is my second year participating in Access, and I'm uh, really grateful to be uh, here today. Um, I'm standing here in my home in Lawrence, Kansas in the US. Uh, Lawrence is the primary city in Douglas County, Kansas. Uh, it's home to the University of Kansas and it's, as you can see, very centrally located in the US. Uh, you might even say that it's the center of the earth. Well, at least according to Google for a number of years. Um, as I said, Lawrence is the largest city in Douglas County, Kansas. Douglas County covers 475 square miles with a population of about 122,000, plus about 20,000 university students, give or take. In addition to Lawrence, there's three towns and 16 unincorporated townships, with Lawrence being by far the largest with over 80% of the county's population. Um, there's three universities, the University of Kansas, Haskell Indian Nations University, and Baker University four public school districts, several private schools, childcare centers, businesses, churches, humane societies, and on and on, um, all places that had to respond to coronavirus. So this is a graph showing the rolling average of new positive cases in Douglas County. Uh, the bump in the middle there shows um, following the final phase of reopening and then the decline after a, a mask mandate and reclosing bars and things, uh, the second larger bump uh, shows the new school year as students return to town. Uh, only about a third of KU's classes are currently meeting in person, but all students, faculty, and staff were tested and continuing on. But that first here, first line over here on the left um, represents the countywide stay-at-home order. This was announced on Sunday, March 22nd, when Douglas County had only four cases, and it went into effect the following Tuesday and I've not been back to campus since a little bit before then. Uh, while this was happening, it occurred to me that this could be a unique opportunity for some contemporary collecting. Through some conversations with colleagues, we decided to try our hand at capturing Douglas County's response to the coronavirus as reflected in online sources to create a snapshot of a community in the midst of a global event. On March 24th, the same day that the stay at home order went into effect, I created a new collection in the KU Libraries Archive instance called COVID-19 Response in Douglas County, Kansas 2020. I will have to update that title, unfortunately, hopefully just the once. Archive is a subscription web archiving service run by the Internet Archive using Wayback Machine technology and processes on a user determined basis, creating a curated collection of websites. Just a couple of basic background terms. A seed is a URL. It can point to anything. Uh, it could be an entire website or a single PDF document or anything in between. There's different options uh, depending that you would select depending on if you want archive it to gather just a little bit or a lot from a given seed. On the other hand, a crawl is the action of capturing the web pages. A crawl could include a single seed or hundreds. It can be run once or scheduled on a recurring basis. You'd usually start with a test crawl and review it uh, before saving it permanently because it is permanent. This is one of the things just to be aware of with archive it. You can delete the seed, but the crawl's content is still saved and could be exposed through search results or content analysis or other means like that. And this could be a problem for things like uh, accidental crawls of which 
could certainly happen, changes in copyright law or a takedown claim or personally identifiable information that may have been accidentally captured, things like that. So just a consideration to be aware of. Uh, working with the University Archives Associate Molly Herring, we talked about some of the other considerations of this. Neither of us had worked with archive in any real capacity before. Uh, KU's had a, an archive instance for five or six years, but it hasn't been very active and especially not for the last several years. So there was a pretty good learning curve as we figured out how to format things, how to scope the seeds and do an awful lot of testing. We talked about the workload, who was going to do what, how often, how we're going to split it up, things like that. And uh, in keeping with KU and the University Archives mandate, the scope was limited to all of and not more than Douglas County. And the idea was to provide a macro lens view of the online activity of one specific county's response to a global pandemic. And if that county happens to be the center of the earth, well then all the better. So taking a look at the collection a little bit, this these are the number of crawls that were done by month from March over here on the left to October. And you can see there's a, a little bit of a ramp up and then a, a big push in April. The blue bars are crawls that were saved and the orange uh, bars are ones that were deleted for a variety of reasons. So you can really see the learning curve. There's about 130 just deleted crawls in April alone. Uh, there's another push here at the end of summer before school started up and we'll do another push again uh, in, in November, December, and we'll just continue as, as necessary. Then looking at the number of seeds added by month, uh, this doesn't really correlate very well with the previous one. You can see this huge uh, increase in May, uh, over 900 seeds in May alone with a little more even distribution among the other months. So here's the two side by side on the top are the crawls with the deleted crawls removed. And so you, you can see that it, it, they, they really don't map well. But the reason for this actually reflects one of the challenges and the solutions that we had with, with making this collection. This is a screenshot of the UDK or the University Daily Kansan, which is this KU student newspaper. This is the search results for the keyword coronavirus. There's a little over 500 articles at the time of this screenshot. Uh, in green, with, with green arrows are marked the ones that we wanted to collect. So just you know where you expect to find things uh, in the sort of search result box and latest news. Uh, the problem is that Archive is not very smart when it comes to sort of pinpointing just this. And because of the way that it crawls things, you're either going to capture way too little or way too much when trying to capture this. Uh, so if, if we try to sort of spread out from the search results page, we're going to capture all this other stuff and it just, it, it's unwieldy for sure. And ad additionally, this is the, the search results for a specific term, but if we search for COVID, there's going to be a different set of search results, some with overlap and some with not. So adding them individually is not feasible either because we've got hundreds of seeds and there's deduplication and it would have to be done. It would just take a really long time. So at some point, uh, it occurred to me that we could use Python to scrape the sites to get just what we wanted. So using a combination of Selenium, which is a virtual browser that can handle HTML or Java-based pages, and the request library, we can get the search results, use beautiful soup to parse the HTML, to grab, grab the articles, as well as metadata about it. So title, date, things like that. Uh, and then collect all that data in pandas and export it to open office format for review and ingest. So it changed a lot about how we collected seeds. Uh, in addition to the, um, the UDK, we've got the, the city's newspaper, the city's website, the Douglas County uh, Health Center, the hospital, the public school system, there was all these places that would publish updates to a single page and then got from there. So now we can just go and scrape those uh, every few weeks and, and grab everything rather than doing it manually. So as it is now, we have just about 2,200 seeds. Looking at the breakdown, uh, you can see uh, this, this big pink, 73% is our pink peach, <laughs> is news articles. Uh, which, which make up just a huge chunk for the reasons that I said, just because there's so many of them. 
if we take those out, we get a, maybe a little bit more clear picture of what we've got, but it can still be a little bit um, misleading. So over here on the this light green is the K-12 education and the dark green is universities. But in this case, the K-12 education mostly represents single pages that are pretty small. Whereas on the universities, a lot of those uh, refer to more domains that have a lot of content embedded in them. But it does give an idea of, of where the content is coming from. Uh, if we look at the data in a different way, we can get the, the size of the content that's collected. So in this view, the, the dark green again is universities, and that makes up about just under 29% of the content, which makes a little bit more sense. And down here on the bottom, this light peach color, even though there's 73% of the total number of seeds, it's less than 9% of the uh, of the size of the content that's actually gathered. Um, we're also doing a little bit of targeted social media collecting. This is definitely a little bit trickier for a lot of reasons. Uh, as anyone who's probably who's worked with uh, trying to archive social media knows, being being targeted and selective is is really hard. But we can use archive it to capture some targeted uh, hashtags or user. Uh, user accounts on Instagram, some targeted Facebook, uh, using social feed manager to, to capture Twitter. We just have to capture or cast a, a more narrow scope um, and, and just focus on a few specific things uh, as opposed to, to regular websites. Uh, so looking ahead to the future, um, right now we're really focused on collecting and creating the best collection possible. Uh, but in, in the future, we do have some things. So Archive Unleashed will work with Archive It. This thing that you can see here is a, is a view of their hyperlink network. And so I've selected this coronavirus.ku.edu. And you can see all these little lines that sort of show how your collection is interrelated to, to each other. And it has a lot of other, other tools for exploring your data once you have it in there. Uh, I'm working on a project to do some content analysis of the newspaper articles, how coverage changes over time, how our county collection might match up with or differ from national projects of the same sort, like the one released in September by Project Information Literacy. Uh, and there's a the whole variety of other uh, sort of ideas that we have, but the, again, the main thing is that we wanna make it available for researchers. Uh, one more thing that I wanted to mention is a problem inherent with collections of this manner, which is, you know, what are we not seeing? Um, it's hard to know what's missing in a, in a collection like this, and because it's not there in the first place to collect. But even if you do identify maybe voices that are, are, aren't represented in these sources, what do you do if the, if the goal of the project is to collect online sources? If the online sources aren't there, how do you address that? And that's that's actually a thing that if, if anyone has any ideas or thoughts, I would, I would certainly love to hear them. And that brings me to my time. So. Thank you. Sorry. Great, thank you very much, Erin. I was like, oh, for some reason, I was like, unmute, unmute. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your presentation, Erin. So I would like to now uh, just give a big thank you. And also, uh, we have about seven minutes for questions. So I would love to hear what folks' questions are today. There are a few here. Uh, so William Matheson asks, uh, where do public libraries fall in the pie chart? I put those under community. There's definitely a gray area between uh, all of those are manually added. The groups are manually uh, created and the seeds are manually added to the group. So uh, I, I put those under community. Mm -hmm. um, great. Um, excellent. So thank you for that. So also we have our Connor Barnes asking, uh, would anything leap out for you? Oh. Sorry, is that you? Oh. <laughs> so 
Okay, sorry. <laughs> I just, I was like, hello? Um, sorry. Um, so Connor's asking, did anything leap out for you uh, analyzing the difference between county coverage and other coverage? Uh, that's, well, as far as, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I would say from the county, it was focused definitely more on the data and the um, sort of that's where all the where all the graphs are and, and any of the many, many of the other sources say if you want to find out what's happening, go to this site and they've got a really great uh, site that's in uh, Tableau um, with lots of graphs and lots of links and and things it's they've created one hub so uh, it's it's a little bit more on the maybe formal side uh, in terms of of creating a maybe a calming presence and a, and a source for to get the data whereas you know the the others the the newspapers is what I found the most interesting because um, that just has just a huge range of things um, the university there's a, there's just a lot there and actually I just just this morning someone sent me a link uh, to a KU uh, news page that we hadn't found before that had links out to probably another 50 or so uh, seeds and, or not seeds. Um, well, they, they will, we'll treat them as seeds, but 50 sort of projects and, and things that are happening on campus that we'll need to review. And uh, so th there's just a lot, but yeah, I think from county to other, I think that would be the, the difference. Thanks. Uh, and Connor does have uh, one follow-up question here on the issue. So how many people uh, were involved in the project? And uh, incidentally, how many like person hours a week does it require? Uh, people involved in the project, it was primarily myself and Molly Herring, who's the University Archives Associate. We really did all the work. Uh, before we really got rolling with anything, we had a meeting with the former university archivist who had, she had managed the archive account uh, several years ago. So she had a little bit of, at least some understanding of what was already in the, in the archive collection, as well as uh, the associate deans of the digital projects and of the special collections. Um, so those were sort of the, the, the group, although the work itself was just done with Molly and myself, we were at home, there was plenty of time to uh, do I, I didn't actually track my hours, but I know, especially in in March um, or in, in April, really, uh, there was there was an awful lot. I could actually I could go pull it up if I had been thinking I could have I could have grabbed that. But um, now I would say it's I kind of forget about it for uh, several weeks, and then I'll run run the script, the scraping script and, and do that. And while that's happening, I'll go and review some of the sites and make sure that things, the, the time intensive part was really the ramp up and the testing because you can, you run a test crawl. Um, there was one, for some reason, the Chamber of Commerce, I tried to grab just the one page and it came back with a 30 gigabyte crawl. Um, and so, you know, scope, learning, learning that learning curve of how to scope and capture just what you want. That was really the time consuming part once you understand how it works and how to format things, it's, it's fairly easy depending on what level of input you want to put into sort of gathering new seeds. Excellent. Thanks, Aaron. And Connor's saying, rad, thank you. I agree. <laughs> also, thanks for bringing it back. I like rad. Great, thank you so much. Are there any other questions? We have about two more minutes for questions if anyone has anything they'd like to ask? Okay, excellent. Thank you, Aaron. Yes, again, sorry you. for leaving you hanging toward the end there. <laughs> Gotta love technology. It's connecting and still has our same issues. Excellent. And um, great. So that gives us a few minutes. So um, to introduce, uh, yeah, I do love it, David. We gotta love it, we do. Um, <laughs> to introduce Peter Bankley, um, who is joining us today. Uh, he is actually connecting, I believe he found some alternate workarounds and he's joining us uh, for, from the University of Alberta. Well, technically, but he is from the University of Alberta. And he's going to be presenting Extending Wax, full featured IIIF in a static website. 
And again, I could have butchered that acronym. I don't know. So I'd like to give Peter just a, a minute or so to set up. I know he was setting up before. Yeah, I think I'm. I think I'm good. If fantastic. Can you hear me? Okay, Do you need to share me... your screen at all, Peter? Or are you yeah, good? yeah, I've, I got it here. Let me. Oh, okay, awesome. Just want to step on your toes. Perfect. I will mute, okay. and I will uh, give you the floor. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we had a power outage here this morning and it came on again just as I was finishing the alternative setup. So I got to rush to get back to the regular setup. And I think I'm okay. Uh, and, and yeah, the official pronunciation that's in the spec is triple IF, just so everyone knows. So I'm going to talk to you about a, a project called WAX. There was a, a talk last year at Access uh, by Daryl. Uh, uh, Dale's story about uh, their use of it at, uh, in Saskatchewan, and I'm going to talk about extending it. So it, WAX is a minimal computing uh, platform for blogging, or it, 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 yeah, built on, on the purpose of blogging, uh, uh, using the Jekyll platform. But what WAX adds is IIIF. So it uh, adds the ability to generate static image files and uh, the other artifacts that IIIF uses, including the manifest. And we just heard a great use of the manifest uh, by the UVIC team. Uh, so that's the kind of world that, that, uh, that WAX enables you to participate in with a very small low-tech project. So it uh, is, is a paradox of low and high-tech. It's minimal computing. It's a static website that can be served uh, anywhere really, minimal requirements on the server, but with the IIIF enhancements, it can actually, it can do fancy user facing uh, uh, functions. And that's what I want to maximize. So the niche I see it occupying, I tried to express in terms of supply and demand curves. So the, uh, I'm talking about the cost of labor uh, and effort going into uh, presenting a single item, so this is item level thinking, versus the supply of features that you want. If you're doing a mass digitization project, you're going to end up down at the lower end of the, uh, the line. Uh, you're not going to put a lot of item level effort in because you've got millions of items and that's going to entail a sacrifice in item level functions. You're not going to do lots of individual markup of, of items. Wax is for people who are up at the higher end of the curve or of the, the slope. You're willing to put more effort in because you care about this single item. That's why you're doing it. And, you're, and you want more features for it. So you're up here uh, thinking of this as a scholarship project rather than just a digitization project. You're going to enhance the item with lots of, of scholarly additions. And what I'm hoping to add to, uh, to, to help with uh, in the WAX context is to bend this curve down a bit so that you get more features for less cost because a lot of it is already built in. WAX uh, is most suitable then for projects which are fairly small because you're going to do that item level work that are finishable, that you're going to do this work of scholarship and you're going to treat it as a publication as if it were an article or a book. And when it's done, it's done and you just want it out there for people to use. Obviously, a little updates are possible, but the, it, that's the mindset. Um, suitable for projects where you don't have a sysadmin who's going to keep a database running for you for the rest of your life. Uh, and uh, in all of this, you're working directly with structured data in formats like CSV or YAML, uh, and, and that you have to be comfortable doing that. So WAX is a set of rake tasks, that's a scripting environment, that convert the input, the images, the structured metadata, into the fodder from which Jekyll, the static blogging environment, builds a website. And WAX also provides a front-end theme that uh, enables some of the IIIF front-end stuff. The IIIF stuff is at the level zero of the IIIF image API. And that's the, the minimal level of service that can be met by static pre-generated tiles uh, as opposed to a, a full-featured tile server like Cantaloupe, which was uh, mentioned by uh, William in the Canadiana context. 
So you're not going to get uh, arbitrary size tiles or color flips or anything like that. You're just going to get the pre-generated tiles and the, likewise with the JSON artifacts. Wax steps it up a bit from the, the image level to also provide you with the, the presentation API manifests. And those are key to the kinds of services we want to add. Uh, current Wax doesn't make much use of the manifests uh, because it's working mostly at the image API level. And so part of what I'm adding is, is, pulling, is, is doing more with the manifests and enriching them to do that more. So what I'm adding are annotation lists. And these are a, a IIIF uh, component, which uh, in version two of the APIs are in open annotation uh, formats. Uh, for version three, they're moving to web annotations. Uh, I haven't gone that far because uh, the, the internals of WAX don't yet support that, but we will obviously need to make that step. Um, annotations are powerful. They, they are how you get uh, all sorts of interesting things to happen on the screen when someone is looking at a IIIF uh, object. So what I'm trying to do is uh, uh, enable them in a way that will be very flexible and allow people to add whatever they need to, to uh, into the IIIFs. That's where the scholarship happens. Uh, working with WAX, I should probably skip over this fairly quickly. Uh, you have the, the data store, that's where you have the human readable, human editable uh, data and metadata. It gets converted by the rake tasks into the stuff that Jekyll understands and then Jekyll renders it into a site, which is HTML. Uh, some metadata also gets access directly from Jekyll uh, over into the data. So most of what my work is in this area of uh, using rate tasks to generate the IIIF artifacts that uh, Jekyll will use. Uh, the advantage of this is that the data lives in formats that you can edit, like Markdown, like CSV, like YAML. Um, and developing the uh, developing our skills in managing the data in that way and transforming from one structure to another, I think is, is a worthwhile skill to have in our environment these days. Um, the everything downstream from that, uh, the 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 uh, the wax artifacts and then the, the site can all be deleted and regenerated from data. And that's the normal way you work with wax and Jekyll. A nice thing for hosting, again, thinking of that small project without a lot of resources, is that a Jekyll site and by extension a wax site can be hosted on GitHub pages. GitHub supports Jekyll natively. Uh, those, that second step of going from Jekyll artifacts to a site can all be done by GitHub. So you can keep your site in a, uh, uh, in a Git repository, post it to GitHub, and every change you make whenever you commit it and, and uh, push it to GitHub will uh, update the, the public site. The first step, though, the, uh, the stuff that's outside of normal Jekyll processing uh, isn't supported by GitHub. So you do that locally and then push the, the changes up. So what am I adding? And I have a demo. And let me get it here, uh, which I have preloaded, uh, but I'm off the page here. So it's this is more or less what native wax looks like. What I've got is a, a family heirloom, a recipe book from about 1859, uh, which is about when I thought I would be giving this talk from before the power came back on. Um, so it's uh, my great-great-grandmother, Mildred Wheatley, and her husband's. They assembled this book of um, recipes. They clipped them from newspapers. They copied them out. That's actually William's handwriting. And the story seems to be that they moved back in with his parents, and Mildred didn't know how to cook. And uh, uh, William would copy recipes out of his mother's cookbooks for her, suggesting an insight into the relationship between the two women. Um, so this, well, use this as a stand-in for something that would be worth uh, giving a full scholarly treatment to. Down here, I've got a link to the manifest, and that's what opens the door to lots of new things. And I'm going to demonstrate what it can do. This is all done uh, without making much use of the manifest. This is a, a purely image uh, uh, access to the object. 
But over here in the Mirador viewer, and you can see I'm using the, uh, the demo that's on the Mirador site. So I haven't done anything at the back end here to, to make anything happen. This is just them reading my manifest. Um, I have added, so I've got the normal Mirador ability to browse the images, but I've also added annotations. And I hope you can see the colored boxes around some areas as I go around. Here's the chicken salad recipe, the annotation, I've transcribed it and OCR'd it. Uh, oops, there's a, something I meant to update. Um, so that is uh, the, uh, the basic functionality that has been added. Uh, this is actually based on a, a, a pipeline I've created which imports OCR from the HOCR, the Hoker uh, format. So you can see some of these uh, have just raw OCR text that I haven't corrected yet. Um, more interesting are the ones that have uh, the source of the clipping. And I spend a lot of time searching for these. Uh, these are really useful because they're, they're clustered in late 1858 and early 1859, which helps me to date the, uh, this activity. And from the same data, the same backend structured data, I generate a web page for each clipping. So it now has a URI that I can use to refer to it in a linked data context and provide the information, provide a link off to the, uh, the original and so on. And uh, I am going over time here, so I will just skip ahead to, um, yeah, this one, I'll just, ah, sorry. And I jump way ahead. And now I'm completely lost. Well, I, uh, for, for one of the um, recipes, given the recipes are a theme of this conference, I, I actually marked it up in schema.org and uh, it will be on Google if you uh, decide to uh, boil a goose because boiled goose recipes are not that easy to find. Um, so how does this benefit us? I think the, the uh, the main benefit is the save is to save orphan projects. That small project, that small research project that has a short-term grant, the work is done, the scholarly value is there. How do we keep it alive once that researcher has moved on and the grant has run out, run out and the people running the server uh, are not the people who are committed to the project itself and may have forgotten that it's there. So this allows for longer term uh, uh, life for those small but valuable projects. I'm conscious that I'm at risk of falling into the gap that Jesse Lawyer uh, outlined in the keynote, the, the gap between technical excitement and the actual needs of actual users. So you will, uh, if you choose to follow this path, you'll want to look carefully into what, what you're getting and what, what it costs you to use it this way. Uh, I think the risks of committing a project to WAX in this way are, are scalability. If your project grows beyond what you expected, you may exceed what it's uh, the, the scale that is comfortable to work with in WAX, and you may exceed the hard limits that GitHub imposes on GitHub pages. Your, your repo can't be more than a gigabyte, and uh, image tiles can fill that up. And the other risk is obviously the obsolescence of the components of the WAX environment. And that is a restricted risk in that uh, uh, there's no application beyond the web server itself. So your database, your uh, Rails environment and so on uh, are not something to worry about since they're not there. On the other hand, the, the Jekyll environment and the WAX code to uh, upgrade things uh, could become obsolete and unsupported. And that, that's where the real risk is. And the mitigation of that is in the structured metadata itself. Uh, the site can be designed so that these, the structured metadata is a data set that can be preserved. It could be deposited into a data store uh, for uh, preservation as a scholarly output itself. And even if the site disappears, the, the, the content, the, the, the scholarship is still there. 
And that, wow, if I, if I can, I've got a minute. If I can just do the, the goose recipe, that would make me feel better for having spent all that time on it. Uh, you know what? I have messed up that link completely. So. No, there it is. Twenty six seconds. Here's Google testing my schema.org markup. Fourteen seconds. Can Google do it? Yes, it is a good schema.org. And here's what it will look like when Google displays this. And look, I've got 18 positive 5.0 reviews on that recipe. And that's it. Uh, I will unshare, right? And get back to you. Awesome, thanks so much, Peter. I also have to say thanks so much for sharing um, your experience today and also such an engaging example. There's been like a little bit of a, a debate in the comments around raisins in rice pudding. <laughs> like the I'm, I'm, that it's, <laughs> I, I'm glad we went straight to the core issues yes yeah, right we're talking about the issues today you know um, <laughs> I for one will be looking at the soap for chapped hands since we had snow here in Edmonton yesterday so now That's we got right. to... yes. oh yes we had countdown to the goose recipe I liked the attention as well thank you for that <laughs> no it was great thank you so much for presenting and for rolling with the technical issues you had to experience today. I was well done, must say. Um, now we have some time for questions. Any questions for Peter? Here we go. So Jeffrey uh, has a question. Any ability to add a community input transcription tool for the handwritten recipes? Yeah, there are. Uh, that's where participation in the IIIF ecosystem uh, really pays off. There are tools out there to uh, to help with that. And the, out, the outputs would be uh, IIIF manifests and annotation lists that, that could be included in this. Um, uh, Brumfield Labs is the uh, the people who've been uh, I think pushing pushing that. Though there are other projects as well. Um, I don't have all the uh, the whole pipeline put together to import those, but it's uh, part of uh, where we're going. Okay, great, great. Uh, Evan Will has a question as well. Is the University of Alberta using Wax in production library or in digital humanities projects yet? Uh, no, this is a, a personal enthusiasm of mine. Uh, I've been, I've got a couple of projects. Uh, uh, I'm now working uh, in the Digital Scholarship Center and I'm helping uh, students and junior faculty who come in with projects to find the right uh, vocabulary or technology. And I've been helping, uh, I've got a couple of them using uh, Jekyll and, wa and not, not Wax yet, but uh, no, one of them is using Wax. Uh, for one of these projects and, and those have worked out well and and that's what really what uh, brought into focus for me the the uh, uh, requirements for that kind of, of small-scale grant funded project that that you still want to be a permanent part of the scholarly record excellent thank you so we have a few minutes left for questions any other questions for Peter this morning as we, uh, before we move into our break time, which we'll talk about. I'm realizing I'm, this morning I'm realizing more than ever that I am in fact part Muppet because I'm constantly moving <laughs> while people are <laughs> waiting for things. Awesome, well, thank you, Peter. And I, and, um, oh, one more question, Dan. Oh, or is it a comment? Spotlight versus Wax, the ultimate showdown. But wait, here comes Omeka. All right, uh, fair point. 
Awesome. Well, I want to thank you very much, Peter. And I want to thank all of our presenters this morning uh, for sharing their time and knowledge with us and experiences. Um, it's been really fantastic to see such a range. Uh, Wax is the e Yes! <laughs> the Ewoks. Um, so, uh, you know what that does? That will give us uh, a few minutes now to move into our, our mind and body break. Uh, so, a few housekeeping moments for that. So at 10.30, uh, Alex Garnet is going to be uh, in Twitch uh, showing us some of the digital landscapes. But I would also like to put out a call for any folks that are hoping to participate in the pet meet and greet. If you have a pet that you would like to feature, please raise your hand and we can change the settings so that you can share video. And, sh and by proxy, share the video of your, all right, Alexis, thank you. We have some folks starting to share because frankly, nothing gives me serotonin more than pets. Yes, I agree with Tamarack, show us your pets. Um, so what I'd like to do is, so now everyone knows, raise your hand and we will get that set up for you. Um, I would like to segue it over in the next few minutes to Alex Garnett. Um, and I'm gonna very quickly give his, give their bio, there we go. So Alex Garnett is a research data management and systems librarian at SFU. He came from the computer and to the computer, he must return. And I have to thank Alex for giving me the opportunity to give that awesome bio as well. Oh, and Jordan, Jordan, you're a trooper. Jordan has said if there aren't enough pets, uh, they're happy to wake theirs up from naps, which is fantastic. Okay. So, so while we are getting set up for, oh, thank you, for Twitch, I am segueing out of my moderator duties. You're free of me, but thank you everyone for bearing with me. And I'm really looking forward to the rest of the conference. Hopefully I'll see you again. Hi everyone. I'm going to be your moderator for the next round of sessions. Alex, if you're ready to go, feel free to start streaming. Welcome back. It's me. It's Second Life. Testing, testing, testing. Here we go. All right. It's break time once again. Uh, thank you so much to Ali. Thank you for the morning's presenters. Those were some terrific talks. I loved hearing about wax. I have had a longstanding interest in both large images and candles, so it really fits into my household budgeting scheme. All right. So you'll see we are now in what's called the Da Vinci Gardens of Second Life. Um, there's a dragon over here. It says, uh, dragon tours since 2018, 12, 17. Hope that dragon company is doing brisk business. Uh, what do we have over here? It's got a nice owl, an extraordinarily garish uh, gift shop door. Looks like it was done um, totally in uh, gold paper leaf. Um, I'm going to probably try to exit through the gift shop as one does. Just gonna make the dumbest dad jokes I can. Um, all five minutes I have today. All right, hop on. This ship takes you to Treasure Island. Not sure I'm ready to hop on just yet. Um, we are doing a pet showing in five minutes once again. So my, my time here is short. Um, hold on to those pets. There is a cat. It says, please tip the cat $75. Um, that sounds pretty good. Uh, finally, cats can earn their keep here in this wonderful world. All right, up we go. Wee! Love doing that. So now I seem to be in some kind of fancy bed chambers. This reminds me, I was just watching Shrek recently, um, and the bed chambers in Shrek really lovingly modeled. Not sure if anybody knows that when DreamWorks was working on Shrek back in about 2000, they were concurrently working on The Prince of Egypt, which was a prestige animation adaptation of Yul Brynner and Charlton Heston Cecil DeMille's Ten Commandments. And um, that was thought of as the much more prestigious project. When animators would actually fail off of Ten Commandments, they'd be put onto Shrek. And that was known internally at DreamWorks as being Shreked. So there you have it. Sometimes you can fail upward because as we know, Shrek was a big success. If not for the wonderful architecture inspiration of Shrek, we probably wouldn't have this Da Vinci castle in Second Life. So I'm gonna keep flying up and up and up and up and up. Uh, just coming at you with facts and knowledge today. Okay, let's see how high I can go. 
I think I'm flying. I'm sort of like if Superman had a stroke, it doesn't look like he's really leaning into it. Like he's not selling it very effectively. Those pants probably like they're very bad for wind resistance. I have to imagine. Um, all right, coming back over here. There's the boat. Going to get over. Whoopsie. Okay. I believe I can breathe. No, nope, I stopped moving. Okay. So I think I just drowned, um, but that's okay. Let me see. There's a, there's a rather uh, foppish gentleman. Um, we are now doing Second Life's Barry Lyndon. So I'm going to try to marry a governess and then take over responsibility for her terrible son. I'm going to touch this person. Uh, I think we're doing a, okay. I, I seem to be just kind of glancing at the front of his boat. That's nice. A nice masthead. Barry Lyndon Labs. Wow, that's a really good joke. Thank you for that. I'm doing my best to keep an eye on the Twitch uh, chat, but as you can see, I'm being rapidly upstaged and vigorously so. All right, so back to where I started. Here's the owl. Um, I think I'm going to go check out what is going on in Treasure Island. So hop on. Okay, this ship takes you to... Whoa! Okay. This ship instantaneously takes you to Treasure Island where the textures are not all loaded in. Wonderful. All right. So, uh, God, Second Life is a wild and crazy place. Um, so now I've got a sign that says teleporter, list of other destinations I can go to. Um, feel free to make suggestions for tomorrow. We've got Ancient Realm, find Pharaoh's Tomb, Pharaoh is misspelled. Rocket takes you to planets, disco in space, dripstone cave, dance at the old lighthouse. Man, that reminds me of Weekend at Bernie's. There's, there's so much going on here. Um, really, you can do anything in virtual worlds. So let's see if I jump on up to this treehouse. This looks lovely. Um, I really want to get a yurt someday. I'm not sure how y'all feel about that, but this is really indulging my future yurt dreams. There's a piano um, that has uh, seemingly a laptop open to YouTube at it. I don't know if I can play the piano. Uh, doesn't look like he knows what he's doing. He's just ineffectually slapping his handheld radio on the keys. So maybe, maybe that's not, uh, don't put me in debtor's prison's musical specialty. Whoop. That, that flying animation never gets old. Uh, it really does look like it's just the least effort possible into flying. All right, what do we have here? Ooh, okay, here we go. Three secrets to building, creating, endless clients, leads, and wealth online. If you are interested, send me an MC and I'll send you the replay. You choose to go onward. All right, so we've got some, um, some get rich quick schemes here in Second Life. That's pretty cool. Um, I might try to attend a wealth seminar uh, later this week. Again, I am taking requests. I really wanna stress that. The goal is to debase myself as much as possible for five minutes at a time over the course of the next several days. All right, whoop, I seem to be flying through some unloaded treasure chests. Uh, this guy who I'm playing as, I really wish I could do up one more button on the shirt, feels a bit much. Um, looking into this glass aquarium. Nobody is here, I'm noticing. It's got sort of like a post-apocalyptic uh, beach vacation vibe. Feels like something that Air Canada is trying really hard to sell me in the back of the in-flight magazine. Um, wait, hang on, I see people. This is going to close out my time with you today. All right. This fella uh, looks like no one's idea of a good time. He's very two-dimensional. He's like one of those creepy pictures where he's always looking at you, no matter where you are in the haunted house staircase. So expect there to be a murder mystery involving this fella later on. And once again, torch, uh, touch for sing and couples dances. Well, I'm going to touch this, and then I'm going to turn off my stream because I don't know what's going to happen next. All right, everybody, thanks for joining me today. I'll be back here same time tomorrow. And that's Second Life with Alex. And now, a pet meet and greet. Goodbye. Over to you, Cody. I seem to be unable to start my video for some reason. Oh, there we go. Okay, good. And he's still telling me I'm unable to start my video, even though I started it on the call. 
Um, if you want to try rejoining, that might yeah. be the best way to go. For I'll anyone who is currently ready to show their pet, feel free to turn your video on and let us know if you can't. You should have been promoted to panelists. I assume that chat message means that Jordan's cats are awake. <laughs> All right, give me one second. Oh, look at that, who's that? Everyone's pets are looking good. We have here a 12 year old miniature schnauzer named Mr. Doodles. And he is an old grumpy man, as you can tell, in need of a haircut. People can feel free to unmute themselves and tell us about their animals. This is Jolene, if you can hear me. And this is Lou. And the two cats will not be enticed here at this time. I've been using yogurt to get their attention because it's very effective. I'm going to go look for some cats. Hi, this is Sarah, and this is Rocket. That's a nice name. So this has been Monroe, who's been playing today. So he's uh, got a lot of energy. He's not been impressed with me attending conferences. So. <laughs> Monroe. This is Char. Char the bearded dragon. He's uh, he's pretty pretty chill most of the time. He likes to hang out in the sun. So does my dog. <laughs> Literally, if it's sunny and it's come through the window, he'll like go over to you and kind of look at you and kind of nudge you. He's like, hey, put my pillow in the sun. <laughs> Char was a little bit uh, disappointed when he saw there was a call for floofy animals. He doesn't really floof very much. Someone's dog's catching popcorn. Hey, y'all. This is Murphy. He's a big boy. They used to call him the land whale at the foster home that he was at before we had him. And this old girl that is not going to get up is named Kai. And so she's 15. So she just likes to sleep a lot. This is Dingus. Oh, Dingus made it. Krista, what's your cat's name? This is Kaylee, and if I sit down, this is what happens. So <laughs> work is hard. <laughs> Kaylee's, well, we've had Kaylee 17 years. And oh, wow. With two or three when we got, oh, waking up, are you? I made noise. <laughs> It looks like someone might have a, a Westie. Yeah, this is Buster. He's a sort of a Bichon Westie sort of thing. We've had him for, he's about nine probably by now. But yeah, this is, this is him in his recently haircutted stage. Yeah, Mr. Doodles, the schnauzer is, I just booked him a haircut for next Thursday because he's pretty shaky. <laughs> There's so many cute animals. I didn't bring an animal, but because a couple people asked, I brought my guitar. <laughs> well, <that's laughs> Not a... quite the same. What what make is that? It's a Gretsch. Oh, is it? Okay, nice. Yeah, it's kind of pretty. It's not mm -hmm. floofy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't actually have a pet right now, and, but they are floofy. That's Fox. Yay! That's... Chibi fox. Uh, chibi in Japanese just means small, so <laughs> it's fox. Chibi fox. Octo fox. Chibibi fox. That's Firefoxy. He is actually the official Firefox 
plush toy. Buried underneath the camp <laughs> is Fluff Bun. He used to sit in my office when I had an office. <laughs> and then I have my flying pig. His name is Goochan. He's a gluttonous pig. They have a Twitter account. Please follow them. <laughs> <laughs> if you're into cute animals and food, it's mostly food pictures with with plushies. Um, yeah, I will. <laughs> they are actually on the pets page for my company as well. My company has a team page with all our team members, and then we have a pets page for all our pets, and they are actually are on there. So I thought that qualified them as a pet. Speaking of foxes, hi, this is Tomo. He's a Shiba Inu. He's turning three in two weeks. So he I love him. Inside, I would die for old. him. Oh my God. Shiba's are awesome. Yeah, so his full name is Tomodachi, uh, which in Japanese means friend. So he's my little friend. Um, but he's very upset with me for waking him up from a nap. <laughs> So Pico showed up for the very end of our panel yesterday, but Pico is um, former president of Olita with John Fink. If folks were at, was it OLA 2018 or 2019? I think it was just, I think it was two years in a row that Pico's face along with John's was all over the conference because that's the, the photo he submitted was him meeting Pico for the first time. Sounds like John. John is the first person to wish my dog a happy adoption day. Most years in like before me, like I will wake up and he will be like, happy birthday, Wyatt. I'm like, that's right. Thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs> Anyway, this is Wyatt. He is approximately six now. Um, I think he's beginning to realize that I don't have checks in my hand when I go like this. Um, and he'd like to return to the couch. So he's being a little, a little less than cooperative. But if he could understand that you were all people, he would be very excited. He would want to say hi because he loves strangers. He doesn't understand how computers work. Who's among us, buddy? And who's got He's the a mediocre really... at catch, but I'll probably try a few more. <laughs> He's who's got the very tired looking, possibly whip it on the coach? Oh, that's me. This is Willow. She's very, very sleepy. <laughs> is she a whip it? Uh, some kind of mix. She was, she was a uh, rescue dog from Mexico. Oh, and wow. So we don't really know. Uh, but we suspect some kind of whippet in there. Awesome. And because I couldn't let Janice be the only one showing a guitar, I told her that I would show my favorite guitar too. This is a PRS Mark Tremonti signature. And it has lovely bird eagle inlays on the frets. And this, I spent an entire, when I was young and dumb. I spent an entire tax return check on this thing. And, uh, but only because my girlfriend at the time told me to. And you've, got a, and you've got a whammy bar. Yeah. It's got the PRS tremolo on there. <laughs> it trims up and down. Yes. Is anybody else left to introduce their pets? You might've gotten everybody. Well, I see Dan holding up a guitar, so clearly he needs to talk oh, nice. about this now. Oh, it's it's my old jazz bass special from about 1986, I think. It's a bass. Played it a long time. Yes, I agree, Tim. Jam session is definitely necessary. Hey, everyone. We are at time and going to be kicking off the next round of sessions now. So, Cody, I'll let you uh, close off. Thanks everyone. This is a great time. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're just going to make sure that everyone's muted and their videos are off uh, really quickly. Thank you. 
And now we're going to kick off with the second round of sessions for day two. Thank you all for sticking around with us and for bearing through our technical difficulties. Um, we are uh, a respectful space. Access is, has a code of conduct that uh, we encourage you to take a look at on the under the about page in the conference website. Um, as you're thinking about how to engage with the conference today and in the next few days, take a look at our social events page. If anyone is having troubles connecting, please let us know via Slack or via email. This is really helpful in terms of our troubleshooting and the follow-up emails we can send tomorrow morning and then the next few mornings. Um, there are quite a few speakers uh, in this session. Again, we're going to do questions at the end of each uh, speaking block. If anything is unanswered, we'll move it into the community notes doc. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first uh, speaker of this block, um, Ingrid Reich, who uh, is going to present on case studies and metadata as a service for multidisciplinary research. Ingrid is a digital metadata librarian at the University of Calgary. Her main research interests are in text encoding and metadata services for humanities research. She thoroughly enjoys winter. And I'll invite you to unmute yourself and share your video now. Ingrid, are you with us? One sec, everyone, while we troubleshoot this. Hello? Hello, welcome. Hi, sorry, I was having some technical difficulties. <laughs> no worries, uh, you're very quiet. Um, let's see if we can boost your volume a little bit. Alternate, my alternate unplug my headphones and see if that works better. 
Can you hear me now? Much better. Much better. Okay. okay. So Go for it. I don't have to wear. Oh. All right. So again, apologies for the lateness. Um, I guess the presentation will be a little short, um, but that's okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about some case studies in metadata service for multidisciplinary research. Not audible. Can't hear. Very quiet. Too quiet. Let's see. Let's see if I can add. I can speak up. Does that work if I speak quite loudly? Like a whisper in a long tube. That's not useful. Let's try the headphones one more time. Okay. All right, let's try this one last time. Any better now? I'm fairly close. I can do. Yes, yes, better. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Better, improving. I'll talk loudly as well. Yes, please talk loudly. Okay. Yeah, I can use myself over here too. Okay. Can you hear me? Well enough? Yep, yeah, you are good to go. All right. Again, apologies for all of the technical difficulties, the joy of online conference presentations. All right, so today, as I said initially, I'm going to talk about some case studies in metadata as a service for multidisciplinary research. Um, my slides will work, there we go. I am Ingrid Reicha. I am the digital metadata librarian at the University of Calgary. Um, and most of this presentation is, or all of this presentation, is based off of metadata services in the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation grant for academic research in university libraries, a new model for collaboration. Between 2017 and 2000, and oh, so, oops, well, there we go. Between 2017 and 2019, uh, libraries and cultural resources at the University of Calgary explored how academic libraries can provide a research platform for supporting multidisciplinary research in the Andrew W. Mellon grant, Academic Research and University Libraries, a new model for collaboration. Uh, the grant was divided into two year-long subgrant competitions that uh, took proposals from multidisciplinary research teams from a wide range of faculties. The metadata services unit, including our director of metadata services, um, many staff within the unit, and myself had the opportunity to support research output, outputs from these subgrants. Um, the result of the Mellon subgrants was 12 research projects for multidisciplinary teams that included faculty members from anthropology and archaeology, environmental design, biological sciences, geography, uh, the Arctic Institute of North America, nursing, education, English, classics and religion, and computer science. The grant aimed at engaging scholars in multidisciplinary research via participation and partnership in a collaborative process with the library and focused on thematic areas of Arctic studies, smart cities, and culture discourse. Um, here we have a visualization uh, where the image bubbles represent a uh, research project and the library services utilized. As seen here, uh, many library departments, including analytics, visualization, uh, collaborative workspaces, data curation, digitization, metadata services, rights dissemination, web development, and virtual reality uh, play functional support roles for this grant. 
So that's just a little bit of background about the grant itself and what was involved in it. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about metadata services within these grants. Um, so we'll be focusing on six projects that involve metadata services and discussing some of the takeaways and lessons learned from each. So we're going to look at Scopers World, which was a journey into the Canadian Arctic through art, uh, which was led by Mary Beth McMurray from or Mary Beth Murray, sorry, from the Arctic Institute of North America. Uh, Be Smart, making specialized natural history collections accessible to diverse user, users. A case study involving bees, which was led by Mindy Summers from Biological Sciences. Uh, mapping urban healthscape, led by Suzanne Goopy from the Faculty of Nursing. Uh, visualizing a Canadian author archive, uh, Alex Munoz, which was led by Murray McGillivray from English. Mapping Victorian literary sociability, uh, by Karen Bourier and Dan Jacobson from English and the Geography departments, respectively, and digitally preserving Alberta's cultural heritage, uh, led by Stephen Dawson from Anthropology and Archaeology. Um, so I'll start with uh, Soper's World, which is a journey into the Canadian Arctic. Um, so this particular project uh, leveraged what I would kind of call or what we've kind of dubbed as our enterprise metadata service model. Um, it leveraged a lot of existing metadata templates um, and is largely the same model the library uses for internal projects requiring metadata services. Um, it's less involved than some other participation that we had and more sustainable. Um, I didn't have a ton to do with this project myself, but our director of metadata services was Renee Rayom and support staff were actively involved. Uh, there was an existing template that we used for the description of art that was leveraged and fine tuned. Uh, staff gained some familiarity with Dublin Core um, as it was the collection was up in Content DM, uh, which uses Dublin Core. Uh, staff aided in subject creation. Uh, and perform quality assurance checks. And they used online tools, including Airtable, to manage some staff workflows. Um, and it was pretty easy to bring staff in on these projects. Um, this is just like a brief description of what we have in Content DM for these collections. Um, and some of the lessons learned um, from this project were that there remains a strong role for traditional cataloging practices and principles within digital object description, including subject creation and location access points, controlled vocabularies for names, um, and title creation. So a lot of these particular objects did not have titles. Um, there's also a need to familiarize staff with like Dublin Core and other sort of non-LC uh, vocabularies. Documentation and vocabulary of, of vocabularies and categorization outside of LC is sometimes less robust than in some of the guidelines that, that people are typically used to, um, and therefore sometimes requires some additional procedures and guidance. Um, but all in all, went really well. Uh, for Be Smart, um, this was very discipline specific metadata. Um, there was a pre existing relationship between digitization services and the Faculty of Biological Sciences. Um, agreement on the use of Darwin Core metadata. Um, the research team also had experience in biological exhibit creation and taxonomy. And there was also like a researcher and student driven metadata creation for species identification and consultation on the identification uh, terminology for, for coloration and stuff like that. Um, the lessons learned here, I think, were that in many cases or in some cases, um, it's best to leave it to the experts if, and if there is a continued or pre-existing relationship between faculty and library units, um, kind of the don't fix what's not broken. Um, this particular project involved digitization more than metadata services. And so that relationship had been established. Um, but there was some consultation with myself about like an identification terminology, and that was really the only place where where we needed to to intervene at all. Um, so, and also resulted in beautiful bee pictures. So, I really enjoyed that one. Um, 
for uh, mapping urban healthscapes, which was an empathic cultural mapping project um, done by the nursing faculty that was kind of, um, it took data about uh, recent immigrants to Calgary and mapped how they used different services in Calgary or different um, like public transportation and parks um, and where, where there was discrepancy between, between populations. Um, and neighborhoods and the dispersal of services as well. Um, so there was some consultation with researchers about this project um, and template creation for the deposit of, of resource storage in our data repository, Dataverse. Um, there was assistance with data organization and categorization and data repository training. Um, and there was also the generation of spatial and geographic data to be used for mapping. Um, one of the lessons learned here was that it's always a good idea to kind of have that, that backup person in place for metadata entry um, and present that as part of the plan to principal investigators. I had created a number of templates uh, for resource description for this project based on like resource types, so whether they were scrapbooks or interviews or photographs. Um, unfortunately, the person who was responsible for that final data entry had like a, a family emergency come up. Um, so most of the data didn't actually end up in our data repository. Um, this didn't impact the research team too much um, because they could still use those templates and spreadsheets to keep personal copies of their data, but it meant that the data wouldn't end up being stored in our data repository. Um, also though, where there was sort of that lost opportunity for that data deposit, there was also a new one that was, that was formed. Um, so we did end up generating sort of geographic coordinate data for Calgary neighborhoods um, that were used for the mapping and the creation of sort of cluster maps for those neighborhoods. Um, and the staff member who does our, our map collections and is very familiar with geographic coordinate tools um, performed that. So there was some staff engagement there as well. Um, so, for our next project, which was the Visualizing a Canadian Author Archive, Alice Munro, I would call this sort of a, an enmeshed metadata services model. Um, there was research assistance driven data collection without the application of sort of standardized practice that resulted in a lot of data cleanup at the end of this project. Um, there was a collection of a large amount of data about Munro's works about different aspects of it, both like the materiality. Yeah, we're gonna make the last presentation in a few minutes for sure. Um, I'll wrap this up quickly, I only have a few more slides. Um, about the materiality and content of Monroe's work requiring decisions uh, about what data should be encoded in the text encoding initiative late into the project. Um, and those were sort of some of the hurdles of this project, but at the same time, I did get the chance to provide some co-instruction about the text encoding initiative, um, which is a, a metadata sort of practice for encoding text, if you're not familiar with that. Um, and there was the application of CDI in the encoding process for Monroe's drafts and letters. Um, so that was sort of that. Um, I would say that this project weighed heavily on sort of my expertise, but there wasn't, I don't know, it was, it was a dicey project and I felt like it was partially difficult because I feel like this is an area I'm passionate about in terms of metadata, um, but also because I think at the outset of the project, um, there wasn't sort of, there was too much data amassed and not sort of a focus on a research question. Um, so a difficult project perhaps. Um, Um, there was also sort of moving into an embedded metadata services model for the mapping Victorian social, the literary sociability project, um, which moved away a bit from the enmeshed metadata services, but also still drew heavily on, on some of my own expertise, again with TEI. Um, there was continued consultation um, and template creation, data transformation, um, transforming the CSV files into TEI, which involved both sort of liaising with the research assistants around open or fine, um, and, and then also sort of doing some of that work myself. So that also helped build some new skills for me. 
Um, there was also the use of sort of linked data principles in using BIAS authority files to link to um, authors' names. Um, and there was the opportunity to forge that relationship for collaborative teaching with uh, Karen Bourdier, the English professor. Um, so all in all, again, this is a kind of in, like metadata services model that's pretty, pretty involved, but not quite as involved as, as the previous project. Um, and lastly, there is uh, Peter Dawson's project, Digitally Preserving Alberta's Cultural Heritage, which is kind of a mix between that um, enterprise and embedded metadata services model. So there was consultations, there was quotes for service, templates for resources, um, all of that was done. Um, procedures for data entry that were, were written on instructional sessions. Um, thank you for giving me a few extra minutes, sorry, reading comments at the same time. Um, there was some instructional sessions for, for resource description as well. Um, and then sort of in the next phase, um, there was keywords for subjects that were derived or created by the research team, which then we created subject headings out of um, in the sort of third phase. Um, and then there was the quality assurance check of, of those keywords prior to the subject creation. Um, and there was consultation with the researchers again at that stage to see if they, that subject creation was appropriate and what they desired. Um, and then lastly, there was some consultation around um, the data deposit into Dataverse that they made uh, and some additional checklists created within the data repository for the deposit of that data. Um, I would say both this project and Boyer's, Karen Boyer's project on the previous slide about mapping Victorian and literary sociability have also led to like a continued um, relationship with both of these profs. Um, I continue to work with them, which is, has been personally one of the more lovely outputs of all of this. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my presentation. Um, are there any questions? Um, kind of rushed through that partially because of my own technical difficulties. Hi, everyone. Reminder to put your questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom chat, and we will move things into the community notes document if we run out of time. We're going to give this uh, maybe five minutes longer than we have on the program. Uh, we have a little bit of padding in between presentations, so the next presentation starts in two minutes. If you have any questions, we do have time. And feel free to unmute yourselves as well if you um, have pen panelist permissions and are interested in verbally asking. And if there are no questions, feel free to add them for asynchronous answers in the community doc. We'll drop a link to that in the chat. Um, and we can close off this session and move on to the next presenter. Thank you so much, Ingrid. And I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. No worries. Sorry about that. Um, I have okay. a good next session. Oh, we do have one question. We have one question that just came in. Uh, can, can you mention the controlled vocabularies that were used and how they in interacted with each other or interrated with each other? I mean, some of the controlled vocabularies that were used um, were the Library of Congress subject headings for uh, that first project around the uh, artist. Um, there was also, um, I guess, more so, more so like, well, there was the use of BIAS and, and the author authority files for the mapping project. Um, there was, what else was there? Uh, there was the use of more so standards, I would say, than, than vocabularies without having that directed at a specific um, project. Um, so yeah. Thank you. 
we can continue this in a notes document if there are any other specific standards that you'd like to link to. Yeah, thanks for the question, Tim. Um, Robin, are you ready to go? I'm going to invite you to unmute yourself and get your um, video started, sort of get, get going. Um, I'm going to Hello. quickly read out an introduction. Uh, our next presentation is by Robin Demuel, uh, who is going to present on extending bib frame for special collections, the art and rare materials bib frame ontology extension. Robin is a cataloging librarian at McGill University and works with rare and special materials. Her work focuses on critical approaches to knowledge organization, experimenting and implementing linked data for special collections and community generated naming systems. She's a member of the ARM Task Force. Over to you. Awesome, thank you, Eka. And hello, uh, I'm very happy to be beaming into all of your homes to talk about um, the Art Rare Materials uh, Task Force, which I will refer to as ARM from here on. And I am coming to you from my home uh, in Montreal, which is where I live and work, which is on the unceded territory of the Ganyagahaga. So what are we gonna do today? Well, we are going to figure out how to do this. There we go. Sorry, I was in the wrong window. All right, so what are we gonna do? Well, I'm gonna walk you through why I think uh, you might need ARM in your life uh, as an extension of bib frame. And I'm going to go over a bit of the history with uh, the genesis of the ontology, and then talk about um, the work that I've been a part of specifically as the ARM task force and our next steps going forward. So let's get started. So uh, just to kind of frame the discussion and why we're here. So when we think about special collections and linked data and postmark metadata, um, one of the things that comes up quite often is that with materials uh, that are maybe not considered um, like basic library materials, I, I hate creating the hierarchy. So I'm always like, I'm a bit hesitant to call them a basic or generic, but like the more general case, right? Like your average novel. Um, when you get outside of those with things like music or maps, or in the case that we're going to talk about today, which are special collections, uh, which will include um, a big smorgasbord of things, uh, we really pull at our existing metadata models, right? And um, that's the case in the future as it is in our present, where um, we have kind of winched in our, um, our user needs for metadata. And it always goes back to the user, right? Like we're we're tearing our, we're pushing and uh, creating new ontologies and standards in order to adequately describe these so people can find them, right? So people get what they need, that's the whole point. Anyway, I digress. Um, when we think about postmark metadata, the problems that we have now with Mark, and for this case, I mean, where we winch in the special collections material, which is usually in a 500 note, it's a big chunk of text. Right? And where it's informative and well thought out and well researched, it's not necessarily very usable in a linked data environment. Right, So we need to think about that going forward. Um, and also, let's take a second to kind of, so now we have like one part of the framework. So um, we already have kind of like a baseline where we need to extend our existing ontologies, including the frame um, and others. But also, we also have, um, a kind of specialness of special collections. So uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, I'm a rare books cataloger by day. So I kind of do one part of special collections. Uh, but what I mean for the purposes of this presentation is a pretty big umbrella. So it's generally um, the old and the weird is what I like to refer to it. So it's rare books, manuscripts, letters, ephemera, right? The posters, it could be artifacts, but it's also art. Right, so uh, works of art, it could be sculptures, also archival material, which is a whole gamut of different things, including correspondence, which I've already mentioned. Um, and, uh, and so this kind of like makes the umbrella of what special collections are. And, and they're not just special because they're old and weird, right? Or they're also special because of their unique needs. And in this case, um, there's a lot of copy specific information that we care about. Uh, with special collections that aren't necessarily well represented in our existing metadata or in bib frame as it is currently modeled. So, and this information 
is at the copy level because in special collections, we care about the history of the item. We want to know who's owned it. We want to know how it's made um, right down to how the sheets of paper are folded and the printing house that it was in, who owned it, what they did to it, are there doodles, is there marginalia that's pithy or is it the daydreams of an eight-year-old? Who knows, but we care about that, right? Because it speaks to the history of the book because in the study of special collections, people are interested in that context. They want to know where these objects are in history and where the people are also specifically in that history and what that means. So why am I saying this? Well, again, getting back to this idea where um, bib frame is not necessarily designed to, de to deal with all of these special items, we had uh, a declared need. So in 2016 to 2018, there was an LD4P project that actually built a whole bunch of um, built a whole bunch of extensions for these special materials. The two I'm going to focus on now are Artframe and Rare Mat. Uh, so Artframe focused uh, made by specialists with art and art libraries focused on works of art and their descriptions uh, as an extension to Bibframe, and then Rare Mat focused on rare books. So uh, they did their work and. Uh, in 2017, when uh, the initial modeling of all these extensions was, was completed, they realized that um, Artframe and Rare Mat actually had a lot of overlap. So they cared a lot about the same things. And that's what I've just mentioned before, right? This idea of history, the idea of who's owned it and what's happened to it and where has it been, right? So then they merged the two of them together. And in 2018, that was released as ARM 0.1. So um, upon that release, so it was preliminary released as like kind of a first copy, right? 0.1. And it's actually up on GitHub now if you want to take a look at it and use it. Uh, and then now we come up to the kind of near present, which is where the arm that I want to talk to you about is in, 2020, in 2029. I meant 19. I apologize. Uh, we have the task force. So um, the idea was to bring in new people and to have... Uh, to have space to actually incorporate the third arm of, uh, of materials that I was referring to, archival materials, right? And their use cases, kind of important special collections. So uh, the membership of this task force is from the three <clears throat> kind of main professional societies that deal with these special collections. So you see RBMS and the Bibliographic Standards Committee for Rare Books, the RLS North American Cataloging Advisory Committee, which uh, has art as their domain and uh, the archival uh, committee has the SAA Standards Committee, right? So we have members from them and a couple of members at large uh, that comprise this task force. And our mandate was to take a good look at the ontology and bib frame and these archival use cases and come forward with um, a bib frame extension that is specially tailored uh, for special collections that people can use. So like I said, we are a team and these are our members in alphabetical order. My name is first by chance. Um, and there are two asterisks for our two chairs. We have Jason Kovari and Elizabeth Ressi roke Elizabeth generously let me use a couple of her slides including a very great diagram, which you'll see in a moment. Anyway, this is us, bask in the glory. And now I'm gonna speak a bit about what we do and what we've done. So, um, and always take a chance to show Bill. Everybody showed me their pets. I am petless at the moment, but I found this guy in a photo album that I cataloged. Um, his name is Bill. He, uh, this picture was taken in 1913 and he's just great. So back on target. All right, so use cases. This is where we started our work. Um, we grounded everything we did in the use cases for rare books, art and archives. And starting with BibFrame and looking at what it did or did less well, again, back to that idea of the literal, which is okay, but not really great for linked data. Um, we made a truckload of use cases of, the, of which these are a few of the highlights that you'll see. So again, um, you'll see a lot of uh, the things that I spoke about before in terms of provenance and then again, exhibitions and like what people have done to them and so on. And what we would do is we would go carefully from that use case, look to BibFrame for what it had or didn't have and then go from there. And in our modeling, we were very careful not only to balance 
uh, between uh, semantic precision, but also thinking to interoperability and reuse of existing vocabularies that our community are already using. So we can produce something that is easy to use, easy to share, but also um, building in flexibility along the way, because in the implementation of an ontology, we're all going to have slightly different circumstances, right? I mean, we have slightly different circumstances between collections sometimes. So um, with that in mind, I'll give you an example. So uh, one example of the modeling work that we've done involves custodial history. Again, uh, this is the bib frame description for the property. Um, and you'll see that in BibFrame it exists, but it's a literal, right? So, which is much how it is now, right? You're going to have that in like a 541 or a 561 or just a 500 or a 590, whatever, but it's a 500 note and it's not structured. And BibFrame is the same, a literal. Not the worst, and maybe that's all you can do, but we wanna make sure that you have the capacity to do more. So we have this. And thank you, Elizabeth, for this diagram. So what this is, is um, this is an example of our generic events model. So what we ultimately decided to do was to build in a generic events model in order to add structure to these kinds of things. So it can be a custodial history event. It could also be a conservation event. It could also be an exhibition, right? They're all events and they all have the same. So um, with this generic class, we can add the typing. And what you'll see here represented in some lovely hypothetical structured data in the future um, is the event of a purchase of a manuscript. So the top blue where it says MS12, MSS 1260, that's the manuscript. The event is the purchase. And you'll notice AAT there for the art and architecture of thesaurus, a very well used vocabulary. And what we get from this is uh, that Alice Walker, right, sold a manuscript to Emory in June of 20, uh, yeah, June of 2012. There are not 15 months. Um, so whereas this structured data would be, is pretty good linked data, right? It's gonna sit in RDF, it's gonna be queryable, it's gonna be fun. Whereas in bid from as it is currently, it would just be a note. And to kind of make that a sense, it, sentence, it could be um, purchased by the library from Alice Walker, June 15th, 2012, period. It's not terrible, but it's not great linked data, right? Okay, so I have gone incredibly quickly um, hopefully you're all still with me because now I'm going to give you a few more next steps. So that's just like one example of the work that we've done. And a couple of weeks ago, maybe two, we, uh, we put the lid on all of our changes and are kind of ready to get digging for the last stretch, which is great because um, we set ourselves a deadline for the end of 2020 to have the draft of the ontology. Um, so we have re very recently started to spin up this work to publish uh, Owl Ontology, the sequel. We're not sure if it'll be called 1.0 or 0.1.2 yet. We're getting there, TBA, but it will be the updated ontology with all of our modeling recommendations. Um, we're also working on providing the community with some implementation guidelines. Um, and that's all gonna go up on our GitHub and be ready for use. Um, but before that happens, there's gonna be a period of review uh, because when we review things as a community, we make them better, we make them stronger, right? We don't create anything by ourselves. Um, so it'll firstly go to uh, those three major groups where it was before. Um, so that's uh, our list a SAA and our BMS, and also a general call for reviewers. So if you've been watching this presentation, and if you're like, hmm, this is interesting, I want to take a look at it, you're going to get your chance. And so um, that's where I'm at today. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to contact the chairs again. Thank you to Elizabeth for letting me use a couple of her slides. And you can also give me a shout. I'm always ready to chat. I never really run out of things to say. Um, and you can also watch us on GitHub as we start to build. And that's, that's my show. Thank you so much, Robin. And just a reminder to everyone to drop questions in the Q&A. Uh, I'm not seeing any in there right now, uh, but we can 
we can maybe uh, hold off for a few seconds. We have a little bit of time. We are extending by a few minutes. You're getting some props uh, in the chat and on back channels. I think to, oh, thank you. Um, I think just for a moment, I wanna go back to like Dan's comment about, about adding to the frame proper and I agree. Um, and maybe, maybe BibFrame 3 will try something like that. Who knows? <laughs> and just a reminder, if you're still percolating this information and have a question later, you can drop it in the community notes document. We'll be asking our presenters to take a look at that if anything comes up. Absolutely. Okay, and if we are, I'm just giving it a second because Zoom sometimes takes a minute with the Q&A feature, but if we're good to go, again, you can drop your questions into the notes document and we can move on to the next session, which is a panel presentation on collaborative constructions, linked data and Canadian cultural scholarship. Uh, we're going to have six presenters. Um, and Robin, I am going to ask that you stop sharing your screen. We're going to flip over to James, who will be playing the first video for us. Uh, our presenters are Susan Brown from the University of Guelph, who likes uh, to collaborate on building infrastructure for online cultural scholarship and researches Victorian feminist literary history on the side. When she get a, gets a chance, she makes things out of clay. Uh, Kim Martin. Kim is an assistant professor in history and culture and technology studies at the University of Guelph. Her research focuses on the information seeking behavior of humanities scholars, in particular on experiences of serendipity in digital environments. Dan Scott. Dan is an associate librarian at Laurentian University and a doctoral student at McGill School of Information Studies, where he is investigating ways to support exploratory search with linked data. He grew up on a farm and drank fresh goat's milk, which might explain a little bit about him. Stacy Allison Casson. Stacy is a citizen of the Métis Nation of Ontario and an associate librarian in the Department of Student Learning and Academic Success at York University. She will be joining the faculty at the University High School in November, contractually limited position as assistant professor teaching stream. Sharon Farrell. Uh, Farnell, apologies. Sharon is head metadata strategies at the University of Alberta Library. Her research interests are in areas of critical knowledge organization and linked data in libraries. She has a background in Russian studies and someday hopes to take a trip to on the Trans-Siberian Railway. And Lisa Goddard. Lisa is the Associate University Librarian for Digital Scholarship at the University of Victoria. She has been involved in library linked data initiatives for more than a decade. Access is one of her favorite conferences and she wishes that we could all be hanging out together in Vancouver. And on that note, James, over to you to play the first recorded presentation. My name is Susan Brown and I'm going to introduce the Linked Infrastructure for Networked Cultural Scholarship Project or LINCS. LINX is a cyber infrastructure project. That means that it's funded by the Canada Foundation for Innovation, our national infrastructure funder, to serve researchers broadly across the country. And we represent immediately more than 50 researchers and uh, a wide range of data sets and disciplines, as well as eight universities and eight other partners in the cultural memory sector. So LINX's mission is to convert, enhance, mobilize, link, and make accessible data sets and to make those useful to researchers across the world as um, research data. And its strategy for doing this is to use a set of technologies that create linked open data. Linked open data makes strings out of text. It creates things from them by giving them unique IDs so that they represent real or conceptual entities in the world and it makes those links that we use on the web all the time meaningful by embedding semantic information into them that can relate different entities to each other. 
So when you put IDs together with ontologies that tell a machine what the relationships are, then you get a web that is machine processable and it's much more like a database than the web that we have now. But it is not a database, it is what's called a knowledge graph because those entities and relationships create graphs. So the entities in this diagram are represented by the dots and the edges or relationships are represented by the lines. And the knowledge graph that we know best is fed into the results that we get sometimes when we search Google, where we get the Google uh, results in the main part of the screen and then off on the right hand side, we get an organized set of information about the entity. And Google has its own knowledge graph, which is proprietary and which we do not see, but it also draws upon the linked open data knowledge graph. And in this case, we can see a few bits of information that have um, quite possibly derived from Wikipedia. It tells us, in fact, that it gets that description information from Wikipedia. It also may be getting the information that Wolf is the author of Mrs. Dalloway from DBpedia, which is the linked data representation of Wikipedia. And uh, it is typing that book perhaps as a book um, through the RDF type attribute, RDF type being part of the uh, RDF schema, a standard developed by the World Wide Web Consortium and it may be using the class of book coming out of its own vocabulary, that is Google's own vocabulary, uh, through schema.org. And I just want to mention too that Wikidata, which is also um, a spin-off of, of Wikipedia, is another very important uh, linked open data site on the web. So the Google Knowledge Graph draws on open data and closed data to present this very different, much more organized set of information about Wolf than it generates through its main uh, search results algorithm. Now, when you look at the linked open data cloud, it's huge. It's got lots of data sets. They're all connected to each other. This is a visualization of it that you can explore interactively online. You can't read this because the graph is so big, but at the very center is DBpedia because so many sites link to it across the web. Linked data potentially has a lot of benefits. Some of these are more potential than real. But certainly right now we're seeing a lot of improved discoverability and sharing of data as a result of the fact that linked open data is based on a web standard developed by the W3C consortium. So all the data is structured in a common way which makes it comprehensible to multiple um, systems. And that means the data can be shared more easily across sites and becomes interoperable because it's structured in the same way. It's using the same entity identifiers. It's using the same vocabularies for properties and relationships. And that means that it's ripe for reuse in other contexts. And um, when you draw together information from across the linked open data graph, you can also contextualize entities a lot better by bringing together the information that exists about them on other sites. A couple of more sophisticated uh, benefits that we hope will come from linked open data are inferencing, because ideally you should be able to take all of that structured information and those properties that relate it and by pulling it together from multiple sites and know more about what those entities have in common and the kinds of relationships that there are between them than might be stated on any single site. And likewise, because it brings together and connects data from across many different sites, it is a good basis for developing systems that support serendipity of the kind that we associate with physical libraries and being able to move through a structured knowledge environment physically. We hope that linked open data can support that virtually. So Lynx is mobilizing a lot of data. Um, it's starting with researcher data and we have quite a lot of it in a number of different fields. It's also very importantly bringing in a lot of the cultural heritage data that's been digitized in Canada through organizations such as Library and Archives Canada and the Canadian Research Knowledge Network with its uh, Heritage Canadiana collections. We're also keen to experiment with really large digitized data sets like those in the Hathi Trust or the Internet Archive because they have some very important Canadian content and we'll be hoping to take not only their metadata but a subset of the data itself and extract linked open data 
from those large data sets. And then of course, we want to link it to the rest of the web, which is very important in terms of being able to um, contribute researcher knowledge back to the web and benefit from the linked open data that's already out there. So what will we do with all that data to make it into an infrastructure for cultural research? Well, we have to take all those different types of data, not just in terms of domains, but in terms of their structure, ranging from very structured to not structured at all, with documents coming out of things like the text encoding initiative in between or library metadata, and we have to convert them. And that process means, uh, first of all, deciding what ontologies and vocabularies to use, we have to convert the data into the format of linked open data, which is the Resource Description Framework, or RDF. We have to reconcile and link those entities up across the data sets with common entities and common vocabularies where they exist. And most important of all, we have to provide means for researchers to look at the results of those processes, those automated processes and scripting and so on that we'll use to do the first conversion and refine and correct that data so that it becomes useful for their research. So we'll have to have a big storage uh, facility for doing this. Um, these are often called triple stores because they store the subject predicate or property or relationship object structures that are called triples in linked open data. And it will have to deal with the fact that this is research data and it will be changing. It's not just um, being converted once. It will have to, to be versioned and made accessible to researchers for ongoing work. And then lastly, but most importantly, in some ways from a researcher perspective is the interface. We can't make this our focus. The funding is for conversion, but it is nevertheless essential that we provide useful access to this data in order to prove its value and make it useful for scholars as researchers. So querying and browsing the data in order to be able to see what's there. We hope to have some widgets that will allow people to use um, our data in other contexts, not just through our interfaces. And um, it will also be very important to have conversion interfaces so that people can continue to work with the data, both to create new data and to continue refining what is there. So that in a nutshell is what Lynx is going to do and we think it will keep us pretty busy for the next two and a half years. But when we're done, we hope that we'll be making a contribution to the larger ecology for linked open data, which includes not just researchers, not just scholars producing scholarship, but the GLAM community and the scholarly publishing community. We all share data. We all have data that can link to each other um, very usefully. And the purpose of this infrastructure is really to try to leverage those connections that are there implicitly in our data, but to bring them out and make them useful and usable. So as of fall 2020, we are well underway. Despite the pandemic, we were able to hire a fantastic team of people who are working very effectively and have made really great progress towards building the links infrastructure. Okay, and uh, now I think we're ready for our next panelist. Kim, are you ready to go? Let's do a sound check. Hey, can you hear me? Perfect. Okay, feel free to share your screen whenever. Just trying to turn my other desktop here. I'm getting an alert message, so let's see if it works. Can you see anything? No, you are not currently sharing your screen. Let's just double check. You, you should have the permissions. Um, I just don't see it. Okay, just a sec. <laughs> um, it's telling my I have to quit. Can we skip me? I'm sure. gonna have to we can move Sorry. on to the next panelist who is um, just double checking. Dan. Are you uh, okay with your video playing now, Dan? And we can play it from our end, just heads up. Yes? James, uh, we're ready for the next video to queue up.
Thank you. Hi, I'm Dan Scott, an associate librarian at Laurentian University and a doctoral student at McGill University, and I'm presenting today from Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, situated on the lands of the Atikmishing and Wanapate Anishinaabe. As librarians, when we teach students how to search, we often encourage them to use subject-specific dictionaries and encyclopedia to learn about the concepts and people in the new domains they're exploring. These tools help them understand their search results and refine their searches. These supplementary resources used to sit on a reference shelf, but over the past decade, we've increasingly invested in electronic reference collections. However, while the electronic versions are now just a click away, they're also in a different browser tab with a different interface and generally requiring a whole other navigation path that starts from the library homepage, proceeds through a research guide, etc., or maybe just goes to Google or Wikipedia directly. So could we give researchers a better search experience that surfaces this contextual information inside the same interface when they want it as part of their search flow? Well, of course, we're not the first people to ask that question. Here we see Google providing contextual support by pulling in data from its knowledge graph to help you learn about goat.com, its logo, founding date, founders, and social media accounts, but not much about the animals that we searched for. For this particular example, Bing, excuse me, Microsoft Bing, exposes much more data and offers a much better exploratory search interface for somebody wanting to learn about the animals. Library catalog, or discovery layer, creators have attempted this as well. Here's a modern search interface trying to inject some helpful context related to the very simple search term goat. I'm not sure this is helping very much. Here's what that full text link leads to, by the way. A different interface opens in a new tab, not even opening directly to the corresponding entry, on goat DNA, no less. Okay, now I'm sure it's not helping. Libraries can build better systems than this by basing their designs on models that capture the richness of human inquiry. Gary Marcianini defined and differentiated exploratory search from simple operations such as retrieving facts or answering questions by focusing instead on the processes of searching to learn and to investigate, as well as the challenges of developing systems to support these more complex goals. Exploratory search systems seek to assist researchers in iterative search processes that enable them to work through vague search goals, fluctuating uncertainty, and evolving information needs. Ryan White and others joined Marcianini to broaden and explore this rich intersection of information behavior and user experience design. Now, of the many information behavior theories or methodologies that could serve as a foundation for the exploration and implementation of exploratory search in interfaces, I'm currently considering sense-making in information foraging. Durbin's sense-making methodology centers humans in situations moving through time and space and facing gaps and constraints. To achieve our specific goals, we move from a familiar domain through an unfamiliar domain, using the information we access to overcome conceptual and knowledge gaps. In developing exploratory search interfaces, then, our goal is to help people bridge those gaps and construct and deconstruct the sense they make of their worlds. Durvin exhorts system designers to not mandate, as traditional information communication systems do, attention to coherency or centrality or certainty, but rather to the unleashing of sense-making potential. Paroli's information foraging theory takes a rational empiricist approach, building on optimal foraging theory from the field of behavioral ecology. Optimal foraging theory asserts that organisms such as goats employ strategies that optimize their seeking, gathering, sharing, and consuming of food. Information forging theory asserts that humans use similar strategies for dealing with information. Accordingly, Paroli develops models of information patches, scents, and diets. From an information forging th theory stance, then, our goal is to provide meaningful clusters of information with enrichment affordances that the information forger can follow and use to select the most valuable information with the least amount of effort. Humans aspire to be as efficient at forging for information as goats are at forging for food. Now, it's been a frequent refrain. There's only so much you can do with Mark that has not been augmented with URIs to unambiguously identify concepts and things in the record. But look at that beautiful Wikidata link data on the right. If you can get to it, then you can pull out wonderful data like birthplace, an image, a website, birth and death dates, and other identifiers such as name authorities. Oh, and of course, the corresponding Wikipedia pages so that you can extract some good descriptive text. 
If you search for goat jazz in our Evergreen catalog, this is the result you'll get. Back in 2018, I added a feature for music recordings that checks Wikidata for a matching musician or band. If there's a match, it displays a subset of related data from Wikidata and the first few sentences of the Wikipedia description. It was a limited form of exploratory search, although at the time I didn't realize that concept existed. The feature works all right and de demonstrates how, given a rich source of linked data, you can provide a great deal of sense-making context within the researcher's current search environment. These enrichments strengthen the information sent, giving the researcher cues as to the informational value of their potential diet, and make their search more efficient. But relying solely on Wikidata to power it means that, while you have a great breadth of data to draw on, the depth can be limited. For example, less famous Canadian musicians often did not exist in Wikidata. And this is where focused, high-quality, deep sets of linked data, the kind of data that links will attract from digital humanities researchers, is so promising. Being able to build exploratory search interfaces that surface contextual information about not just people and organizations, but about core concepts in a subject area, and that enable the researcher to learn about connections between people, places, organizations, events, concepts, artworks, and artifacts is a holy grail. To be sure, there will be many challenges. Trying to build one search interface that connects different sets of linked data, for example, will require resolving heterogeneous schema. And designing a user experience that provides affordances for surfacing contextual data when the user wants it, without jacking up the interface, is going to be tough. Ideally, though, we'll be able to build exploratory search interfaces that help novices in a given domain of digital humanities become experts through the process of searching, applying the principles of one or more theories of information behavior, such as sense-making or information foraging, and building connections between knowledge domains. Thank you. Hi, I'm LeVar Burton, offering greetings and salutations with love and respect to all those gathered there at Access 2020. Libraries, and more importantly, librarians, have occupied a special place in my heart for as long as I can remember. Going back to... Sorry about okay. that. LeVar was very excited to come back. <laughs> Technical difficulty. We're moving on to Kim now. I'm sorry, Kim, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> All good. Can you see my screen now? No, we cannot. Come on. Oh, yes, yes, I can see it now. We're good. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. All right, let's see if this works for me. Hello, everyone. Thanks for your patience. I did a computer uh, reboot and clearly shouldn't have. So uh, before I start speaking today, I would uh, like to acknowledge that the land that I live and work on as a settler scholar belongs to three First Nations communities, the Chippewa of the Thames, the Oneida, Nation of the Thames and Muncie Delaware Nation. The Lynx community is privileged to work across the traditional, ancestral, unceded and treaty territories of many indigenous peoples and hopes to contribute to the decolonization of the informa information systems that we use. Whenever I talk about my role in Lynx as the research board chair, it comes out sounding like there's a stark divide between humanity scholars and technical folks. And while there may be some differences in the questions we ask of our data or the way we go about getting those answers, we're largely a collective of researchers with a mix of interests and expertise, technical, linked up in data, ontologies, computer science, humanities, and of course, library and information science. My role as the research board chair mostly sees me acting as a translator between those that have data, in this case, humanities researchers, and those that build the tools, the interfaces, and the platforms that will make it possible to get that data onto the semantic web. I attend the high level technical meetings and links and I try to stay on top of what's going on in the world of interface and ontologies and infrastructure. And then I talk both with the research board and the researchers individually to relay that information to them and find out what they want from these tools and how links can help them answer these questions. Um, then I take that information back to the technical meetings and we try to figure out how to make that happen. You know, it's a cycle. The Lynx Research Board is made <coughs> up of Janelle Genstad, Stacey Allison Casson, John Bath, with Susan Brown and Sarah Roger, our project manager. We have monthly meetings to talk about the ways that we can grow and maintain researcher in engagement. And this is because at the end of the day, Lynx can build all the tools that we want to, but we need that researcher investment in the infrastructure to maintain our project and show its utility. 
So far, the group has come together to create a project charter, building on the work by Stan Rucker and Melina Radzikowska, amongst others. And we further developed the original areas of inquiry, um, as you can see here, to be a little more inclusive of the projects and people that are currently in links. We created a survey to go out to all the researchers um, that's actually out there now, asking them to self-select their areas of interest, um, talk about how much time they have to commit to the project, and to see if there are other ways that we should be representing Link's research. In the new year, each of these areas of inquiry will form groups of scholars that will get together to discuss their research and also work together to create competency questions that's, that will be fed back into the technical team, or sorry, fed back to the technical team to help them further understand the needs of humanities researchers when it comes to building tools and thinking through ontologies. In addition to that work, myself, our project manager, Sarah, our ontology systems analyst, Aaron, and our data interface developer, Aaliyah, aren't those great position names, uh, have been conducting what we are calling data intake interviews. We are meeting one-on-one -on -one, or sometimes four-on-four, -four, depending on how large the research team for each project is, to discuss everything from the type and size of their data to be mobilized in telegraphic data, but also about their research questions, their data sets, and how the concepts of granularity uncertainty and provenance relate to their data. And thanks to Erin for those final three questions on this slide. They've turned up really good results. So, so far we have done nine of these interviews, which puts us about a quarter of the way through the Lynx research projects. There's almost 40 research projects um, at, at Lynx as it stands. Um, we started with some of the folks who we knew were furthest along in thinking about Lynx data, those that had been to our workshops or our meetings, etc. And these are the things that we found. We knew some of it going in. We knew that uh, researchers are you know, really inclined to work on tiny little research areas with lots of specific details and nuances. Um, in the cases of that we, people we've talked to so far, um, those nuances are around things like gender and sexuality, um, around thinking about events and breaking those events even down even further into factoids. Um, and then even being able to represent things like staircases in certain buildings in early modern London. So there's a wide range of detail here. And then we've come up against kind of a contradiction um, where we know that there's silos around humanities researchers, um, digital humanist, humanists, librarians, everyone's been dealing with this for a long time. But these silos are also kind of like protective walls around the, the research that people have um, been spending a lot of their time digging into and, um, you know, it's their area and they feel like in these first conversations we're having them connecting to the semantic web, semantic web and agreeing on what certain things mean tends to like feel to them that it's giving up a little bit of ownership over their data. So in contrast to that, they also have a desire to connect to other people's research because that every one of the people we've interviewed so far listed several other projects or data sets that they know their work would be enhanced by connecting to. So we've got to kind of navigate both of those, uh, both of those situations as we move forward. Um, another commonality was that inconsistency, errors in the data and incomplete data are common to all of these projects. And most important, and this has been um, highlighted by Robin and touched on by Susan, is the importance of context. Um, we need to be able to take all the data that we're collecting out of these um, out of these projects, moving it out of its original context and provenance, um, into, put it into linked data form, put it out onto the semantic web, um, make it usable, but then also be able to pull it back and look at it in context. So it's not just data that's floating out there, but it's where humanity scholars expect it to be and also relate it to its new context in the web of data. Uh, finally, we've got three levels of, uh, of users that we're going to be trying to make tools to do all the things I just said. Um, and the three here are those that are kind of familiar with linked data, uh, familiar with Sparkle queries are going to jump right in. Those that could follow a Jupyter or a Spiral notebook or maybe some really thorough documentation. And then those humanities researchers who don't have time or maybe even a desire to learn a new language or even follow detailed instructions. Um, and so we have to be able to meet all of their needs in both our access and our conversion tools. Easy peasy, right? No problem. Well, we'll see. I'm looking forward to reporting further to access folks on progress over the next few years. But for now, I'll turn it over to the rest of these awesome folks for ideas and inspiration. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. We are on to Stacy. 
And I believe that that is uh, another live presentation. So Stacy, if you'd like to unmute and I'm just gonna double check that you are correctly connected. Hi, Stacy, you should be able to unmute and turn on your video now. You've just been promoted to panelist. Excellent. So I think, can you, okay, wonderful. Okay, I'm going to try and share my screen, which is always, uh, let's see. Oh, I'm not seeing that option. In one second. You should be able to share your screen from the bottom of your Zoom window. Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Great. And Perfect. I can see it. Okay. Are we good? Yep. Okay. Great. Okay. So, uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm coming to you today from Oakville, Ontario, which is just outside of. Uh, Toronto, and I'm very grateful to uh, be a guest on the lands of the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Um, and this land is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron uh, Wendat. Um, I'm also really grateful to be part of this amazing project. And so uh, I'm going to walk through uh, some things that are maybe a little bit different. So my role on this project uh, in part is uh, the theme lead for navigating scale and I've just put a, a screenshot from the website here um, and you can see that this has to do with moving from really granular data up to sort of being able to look at data from a big um, sort of farther back uh, view and um, for those who don't don't know me I, I work uh, in um, uh, library metadata, but I'm also uh, a humanities um, scholar with a background in music. And so in my talk today, I'm going to pick up on a few key issues around, um, well, I might call productive friction points between humanities data sets, um, library and other meta metadata. I'm going to use a little bit of my own uh, work to talk about that. And so I think what's different um, about this project than maybe the ways that we consider or think about uh, metadata creation in particular um, library uh, metadata is that metadata is a text to be read and queried and, and conclusions can be drawn from the metadata itself. And typically uh, in sort of traditional metadata creation in catalogs, we create metadata as a, as a means to the end and the end point is somebody getting a resource like a book or a, a map or, uh, oh. Sorry to interrupt, but you're yep. not advancing. Oh, they're not. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Okay, I'm gonna back up then. Let me stop share. And maybe if I try sharing again, I'll try and share from this. Point and we'll see if it's better. How's that? Yep, perfect. Okay. Is that still good? Am I advancing? You are indeed. Okay. Phew. Okay. So, um, so metadata again, as I was just saying, is a text to be read, and there's nothing really on this screen that you that you missed, um, which again is different than the way that we typically think about metadata in the context of um, uh, library metadata creation. So this is not to say, uh, as we already heard about in linked data uh, concepts, it's a lot about creating uh, links or relationships um, um, in our data. But this is not to say that we haven't always sort of been creating those relationships in our bibliographic data uh, as it is. And um, I'm sorry that I missed Robin's presentation because I take great delight in, in as a music cataloger in, uh, in mark codes. Um, and a lot of mark codes that we have uh, available to us have not been used in catalogs. So there are relationships built into that data that haven't been uh, taken full advantage of. And in this project, what I find really interesting is broadening the concept of bibliographic relationships sort of beyond uh, things like uniform titles or uh, relationships between sort of a small number of people who are identified as um, authors. 
And in this project, we can think about what we miss when we create metadata, where pockets of metadata that could be brought together with researcher data. We do know that many of us probably at libraries and our archives have uh, little um, spreadsheets or extra data that is available that we, we could um, leverage. And also how can we be challenged by thinking and looking differently at our data uh, collections? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, a data set that um, I have uh, created and um, I worked on as part of the, uh, as my position in the, as the e, uh, chair in e-librarianship at York and I hope to bring into links at some point um, just to illustrate this uh, a little bit. And so this was a, a data set that I created through uh, pulling data out of about 10 years of the Mariposa Folk Festival programs. Um, and these programs are located in the special collections uh, and archives at York University. Um, and uh, lacking a better place to, or maybe it's not necessarily a better place, but lacking sort of infrastructure uh, or easily available tools to mobilize that data, I did uh, upload much of it to um, Wikidata, and so that some people might recognize a screenshot here from OpenRefine, um, some early work uh, in getting data prep, uh, prepared for uploading to Wikidata, and you can see some of the uh, kinds of identifiers um, that I'd be uh, that I linked to. Um, a little sample of what of mapping the data that I have in a whole bunch of spreadsheets to um, to the Wikidata schema. And then I'm going to try and play this video. Let's see how it works. And then finally, this is a little screenshot of uh, the Mariposa item for, for the festival in 1970. And what I want to highlight in this example is that this is an event. And this is something we don't typically document in our library collections, although they can be quite important. We tend to focus again on individuals who have been uh, granted the status of authors or creators and uh, documents, um, subjects, but not necessarily events in time. And so bringing together um, uh, the uh, connection to events with other kinds of data offers a lot of possibilities about connections we can make again to other kinds of, of data sets. So as Susan was talking about, um, you know, what kinds of data sets can be usefully combined. So for example, looking at the Mariposa Folk Festival, uh, data and thinking about is there other literary data or or uh, geographic data or data from library collections or Canadiana that would be um, potentially interesting to think about in combination. But a really big question, I think for many of those, uh, many of us in libraries that uh, we are, I think, quite aware of is, is the question of scale. So it's one thing when you're dealing with a fairly small uh, data set, um, you can be quite granular and it's, and it's fine, but when you have to, to scale things up to a massive level, you have to think about um, a whole other um, set of questions. And that comes down to things like uh, what harmonization is useful. So granularity is really uh, amazing and you can see all kinds of things, but, but as we kind of move up into being able to scale, we sort of lose some of those ability to harmonize certain data points. And so um, I think that's a really interesting question coming from both the library perspective and also from a humanities research perspective as to where are these questions of scale and data harmonization and where does it fail and why? And what can that tell us also about ways that we can change our library practices, uh, our bibliographic practices in relation to um, um, how we think about collections and how we connect with humanities uh, collections and also for, for working um, in, uh, with humanities or, or research data. So that's the end of my uh, sort of whirlwind uh, tour of a few of the aspects of the uh, Lynx project that I'm thinking about and I'm working on. And um, I'm gonna pass it over to someone else in the, in the next speaker in the project. Thank you so much. So the next speaker that we have is uh, Sharon Farnell, who has a recording. James, over to you. I believe we have that queued up. Perfect, thank you. Hi everyone, 
Many thanks to my colleagues and the ACCESS organizers for the chance to speak with you today and to everyone for joining us for this first virtual ACCESS conference, ACCESS WWW. My name is Sharon Farnell and I'm the Head of Metadata Strategies at the University of Alberta Library and the Librarian Technical Collaborator on the Lynx Project with a particular focus and interest on metadata conversion. I'm going to speak very briefly about a Lynx project involving Canadian theses and dissertations. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you today from beautiful Amiskwichi, Wiskigan, Beaver Hills House, also known as Edmonton, traditional home and gathering place of many Indigenous peoples, which is located in Treaty 6 territory and Métis Region 4. As a settler Canadian, I'm thankful to be able to live, work and study here and strive each day to be a good guest on this land. At the LD4 2020 conference earlier this year, Emma Betcher from the University of Chicago spoke to research on users discovery and access workflows and where and how linked data might have the most impact. This particular quote from a graduate student stuck with me because it speaks explicitly to the value that lies within theses and dissertations, but also implicitly to the challenges of leveraging that value in the way that theses and dissertations are currently collected, described, and presented to the broader community. Theses and dissertations represent the unique intellectual output of institutions, offering cutting edge and in-depth examination of critical issues and topics. They are the product of collaborations and connections between established and emerging scholars, often across disciplines, departments, and institutions. They exist within a network of relationships between individuals, across topics of study, and spanning space and time. To my mind, theses and dissertations are a natural fit for a linked data approach. And since 2017, the University of Alberta Library has been involved in a project multi-phase project to work toward a linked data data model and a linked data driven interface for not only making Canadian theses and dissertations more discoverable and accessible, but for enabling new and novel ways of plumbing their depths. What you see pictured here is the current version of our portal. We have made progress to be sure, but we see the opportunities provided by the Lynx project as what will finally enable us to address some of the challenges in working with these resources and to help push this project forward in a substantial way. A key challenge we face with theses and dissertations is the state of the metadata. What we're often dealing with is metadata that may be in MARC format, as you see at the top left, or some sort of OAI format, perhaps Dublin Core or ETDMS, as you see in the middle here. The metadata varies in terms of quality and completeness. Consistency across institutions, and even within single institutions, is lacking. For example, we find that abstracts are often included in the metadata, but not always. Supervisors and committee members are sometimes available, but also, again, not always. Degree names, disciplines, department and faculty names vary greatly. URIs for identifying and disambiguating entities of all sorts are rare. Anyone who works with theses and dissertations is familiar with some of these challenges. Where we want to get to is something like we see here at the bottom right. Metadata that is consistently expressed as linked data, using URIs as much as possible, from common vocabularies for properties as well as values. We currently make use of a range of tools and resources that exist now for conversion of metadata and enhancement of metadata. However, the conversion and reconciliation tools and workflows being developed as part of the Lynx project will enable us to do this at scale, which will make our work and our project sustainable. But perhaps even more exciting is the work happening in Lynx to leverage machine learning tools and techniques to start finding and pulling rich data, like what you see here, from the text of theses themselves. If we can identify and label entities, be they agents, topics, 
places, etc., and express them as linked data, imagine what unexpected connections, patterns, and networks we might uncover. And those are just the relatively easy, more surface properties. Never mind, once we start to go further, looking at methodological or theoretical frameworks used, analytic or interpretive approaches taken, and so on. Exciting stuff. I focused so far on how our thesis project will benefit from the collaborations and infrastructure that make up the Lynx project. And so I'd like to conclude with a brief reflection on how I believe the project can give back to Lynx. The goal of Lynx is to gather together and enhance a wide range of primary and secondary content related to the broad theme of cultural studies. Link data is built on the network principle. With each piece of data added, the value of the whole is increased. I believe the inclusion of academic theses and dissertations from the CanLink project, representing 4.75 million triples and growing, will contribute to the richness of the overall data set and thereby contribute to the ability to explore, question, and interconnect Canadian cultural data in new and novel ways. Thank you very much, and I look forward to questions and discussion at the end of the panel. Great, thank you. Um, and our final presenter is Lisa Gazard. Lisa, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself and just do a quick sound check for me. Hi, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Okay, and I can see your screen. Great. So here we go. We are seeing your, uh, okay, perfect. Yeah, okay. Close the chat. Okay, great. So um, I'm coming to you today from Victoria, which is the unceded territory of the Song. He's a Squamalt and Wasanic people. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the long term preservation considerations in this project. Uh, and spoiler, I uh, haven't figured it all out yet. But here are some of the issues that we need to really consider. Um, so the way that a lot of linked data projects kind of make their data available over time is in these big textual data dumps that are just these sort of static versions that sit on servers and can be sort of ingested in various ways into other interfaces. And um, that's fine. But one of the challenges that we have with links is that we really want to kind of create a cultural data linking hub which means that we are going to have to mint URIs for certain types of entities, maybe for certain types of properties. Um, for example, you know, annotations. They're not going to have links that already exist on the web that we can just reuse. So we're going to have to mint some of that kind of thing. Um, a piece of an image that's being annotated, that's not going to have its own specific link online. A piece of a text, a paragraph or something. So we have to kind of deal with this issue that we can't just reuse identifiers. We'll do that where we can, but to a large extent, we're going to have to mint some stuff too. And that's a real concern with linked data generally because everything is made of URLs and we don't have a great history of keeping URLs live online. Um, libraries and publishers are better than generic web users, unsurprisingly, um, but still links disappear all the time. So we need to make some technical choices right now that are going to allow us to sustain the project over time. So you need to think about long-term preservation at the beginning of your project. I think all the librarians already know that, but this is a, this is a message that we're still getting out um, to research partners all the time. So right away, we wanna make sure that when we decide what our URL pattern is gonna be, that pattern is not gonna include any information about technology, query strings, um, weird acronyms of departments that might be involved, like you need to abstract away from everything that underlies the conceptual URL and just create something that's totally conceptual and won't change over time. And in order to make sure that the links don't change over time, you really have to kind of create these canonical URIs that you're going to point to that actually resolve to another location. So maybe we create a kind of canonical URI like this links project one that you see here. Um, but when you hit that link, it's actually redirecting you to a server at UVic. And then, you know, maybe Guelph is going to take over that server in five years 
and maybe eventually uh, there's a national Canadian server that we can use and it's going to go there. So regardless, that canonical link needs to continue to keep working, which means that it isn't really the link. It is simply a placeholder that is going to redirect to the place that the link actually is or the resource is actually living over time because it's for sure going to move around. And when you're when you're thinking about doing these kind of links, it's often um, tempting to choose a kind of an institutional domain name because I think that uvic.ca will still exist in 50 years. I think that's a stable domain. Um, the challenge is that uvic, the organization, may not be involved in this commitment in 50 years. So really we need a domain name that can move around between organizations and that can be managed by a variety of different organizations and people. And from that perspective, it's better to mint URIs that have a project specific domain in them. And the issue with that, of course, is that domain names need to be maintained and updated over time. And even doi.org um, almost didn't renew the doi.org domain in 2015. And this is an organization that like their entire job is literally persistence and sustainability. So it kind of points to how much of an issue this can be. And what that means is that we really have got to have um, a set of kind of policies and procedures and responsibilities in place that can be updated over time. <clears throat> and I think this is actually the crux of long-term preservation for just about any project and certainly for linked data. It's that persistence is a function of organizations. It's not a function of technology. So what we really need is to have people and resources and organizations who over time can commit to making sure that this continues uh, that this stuff continues to be available online. And that's a challenge because, you know, our project right now is funded for three years from CFI. So we need partners. One of the really um, great features of the Lynx project is that we already have a lot of partners involved. And so that means a lot of people and organizations and researchers who understand the value of the project, whose data will sit in the project and who have a stake in keeping it going over time. The other thing we really, really need is users. We need a lot of people to use the data, to connect to the data, because that's one of the features of digital objects that, that, are, that survive over time, that they get used a lot. Things that don't get used don't survive. We do have a preservation partner right now um, in Scholars Portal. So um, our infrastructure sits on the Compute Canada Cloud because it's a CFI funded project. So that's where we do it. Um, but Scholars Portal has agreed to set up a mirror server so we can mirror our data as we're creating it just to have some more redundancy in place. But you know, over time, we can't keep our stuff on Compute Canada because they don't provide long-term services like that. And so we really do need to be thinking about more persistent national infrastructure projects. And I think that libraries are well positioned to help to lobby for more persistence in national infrastructure and more kind of long-term hosting for things like ontologies or linked data. Uh, certainly Endrio right now is a great opportunity, but there are organizations like Scholars Portal and Canadiana that might play more of a national role as well. Um, more like we see in Europeana or humanities at scale in Europe. So um, this is one of the big challenges to, to really work nationally to create better research infrastructure that can last for the long term. Uh, so that's it from us. If you are interested in tracking this project, we'd really encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. It's monthly and you can sign up there at the website linksproject.ca. We have a Twitter handle and so follow us on Twitter as well. And if you have ideas about any of the stuff you've heard today, you want to be involved, you want to submit data sets or whatever, then um, we'd love to talk to you. So drop us an email or email anyone you see on this panel and we would be happy to have that conversation. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. And I now invite all of the panelists to turn their cameras on and unmute. Does anyone have any questions? And just a reminder that you can drop questions into the Q&A or add them to the notes doc. We might be experiencing a small amount of Zoom fatigue on day two.
is anyone planning on contributing sets of data to links out there in the audience or interested now? So you're getting some yeses in the chat. Yep. Charles says yes. <laughs> Did anyone think I was being controversial in talking about metadata as semi-structured data? <laughs> I was curious to know what the library would, uh, what the library community would say to that. Although I was somewhat reassured by the preceding um, presentation on on BibFrame. <laughs> and Stacy's, I think Stacy was speaking very much to this point too, right? That a lot of the value in in metadata is sometimes in those notes fields that are you know, just strings. Yeah, yeah and uh, if I can jump in on that, the one of the interesting pieces as well is that there's value to the text as um, too, right? So in pulling in those first few sentences of Wikipedia to give a human contextual description, there's a lot of value in that as well. So if you've got the data and the text, mm -hmm. um, then yeah. you're in a- Ideal, yeah. Yeah, fantastic world. Database yeah. narrative argument we want both. <laughs> we have a question in the chat. Do you see a role for small scale projects like the kind of thing that Peter uh, proposed as WAC project, WAX projects? Was anyone able to be at, I had to be at, a, at an institutional meeting. So Peter, I was looking forward to watching the video later. Um, was anybody on the panel at that presentation and able to speak to that? I mean, I think it, in a general way, we're very interested in small scale projects. Like the whole point of links is that researchers very often have very high value, high quality, but small scale projects that um, can, really add a lot of value um, when they're brought into conversation with other bigger collections. So in general, I would say absolutely. Yeah, I was I was able to catch uh, Peter's presentation. And uh, uh, I think the structured data would be of particular interest. Um, and uh, one of the other aspects was the sort of media um, that uh, went along with it. So um, perhaps um, I I'm not sure where storage of media objects would fit with links in that case. Mm. So I can speak to that. The The storage of media objects would be outside of links. We're not trying. We applied for this grant twice. The first time around, we said, we'll take all the data. We'll save all the data. We'll version all the data. We'll preserve all the data. And not surprisingly, the uh, review panel said, <laughs> too much. Uh, so we are focusing on the link data piece, and uh, but we will be pushing hard to have all of the data contributors work with um, preservation institutions uh, so that the, the data that links to the linked open data will be um, as stable, with all the caveats that, <laughs> that Lisa just gave us, as stable and as, as, as preserved as possible. So we'll be hoping to work in partnership with institutional repositories, trusted digital repositories, and so on to, to make sure that the source data associated with the linked data is, uh, is nicely cared for. I'm not seeing any other questions. Just a reminder that if you're still percolating this information, you can add questions to a notes document. We will ask our panelists to take a look at any questions that do come up. We have a couple more minutes and then we will switch over to closing remarks. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>
Okay. I, I can say something really quickly if that's okay. Um, I'm on a panel with like four people that I have watched and admired at Access for years. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, and I like I think it's just super exciting and I can't wait to get back and tell you all what we're up to next year. So I hope Susan had a first good Access experience. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. And I did get to take in some, uh, even though I, I couldn't be there for Peter's, I did get to take in the earlier presentations. So I'm looking forward to sneaking into some more too. Yeah. I've been hearing about it for years. So it is as fabulous as I thought, even virtually. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Um, we are going to move over to closing remarks now. James, you're up. And I'll just ask everyone to mute themselves and turn off their videos for this. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. I, uh, well, that wraps it up for another great day of access. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much to today's volunteers, Ali, Julia, Clara, Tricia, and Sarah, as well as yesterday's volunteers, uh, Sarah, Amy, Christine, Clara, Julia, and Tim. Sorry if I'm forgetting anyone. Uh, as always, a big thank you to our sponsors, uh, University of British Columbia and Simon Fraser University. Uh, thank you to OCLC, who will be sponsoring Friday's Dave Binkley Memorial Lecture. Uh, looking forward to that. And thank you very much to the BC Libraries Cooperative who've been handling all of our books and uh, operational support. They've been amazing. Uh, just a note uh, that we're aware of some issues with some of the emails going out in the morning for Zoom links and things like that. And so we're, we're working on a fix for that. But as always, if you have trouble connecting, you can reach out uh, Twitter, email, uh, whatever. Uh, a quick reminder to please contribute ideas for our HackFest spreadsheet and mentoring spreadsheet. And prob crawl is that a spreadsheet too? I, I don't know. Uh, so that's all on social events. Hackfest is on the Hackfest page. Uh, tomorrow's an unusual day. We don't have any formal uh, speaking slots. It's just uh, in the morning. Um, Tim Mubarak, I believe, will be facilitating the Hackfest. And for those of you who signed up to either the Docker uh, Mind Test and R workshops, the, those will be happening. Um, the Docker and Mind Test workshops are full. Uh, but there's still some slots for the R workshop. Registration was disabled, but it's been re-enabled. So you can go on to Eventbrite and just leave the top where it says general admission and free admission. Just ignore that and just fill out the R workshop part. Um, that's it. Any, anything else, organizing team? James, I'm just going to jump in to say that if you haven't received an email from a workshop, we're going to follow up with workshop attendees and just make sure you have connection information. Perfect. Uh, we're, we're here uh, if you need anything uh, or have any suggestions, I'm trying to be very responsive. Uh, so that's the end of the programming and for today. Uh, but up next, we have a trivia social event hosted by uh, Evan Thornbury. So Evan, do you want to wait until 1245 or uh, do you want me to hand over to you now? I think Evan is going to tune in in a couple of minutes. Evan, are you here? I, I am here. Yeah, uh, we can we can start now. Yeah, I've got a slide background, um, so I probably uh, I'm ready. This the trivia will start at twelve forty five for those who want to participate. Got it programmed in, so get ready. Okay, so I'll put up the uh, slides for your the our awesome slide deck for your amusement, and uh, we'll start at twelve forty five. This the right slide? Yes. No? Ooh. Uh, there we go. 